Audible Studios presents The Best Horror of the Year, Volume 5 Written by Dan Sean, Lucy Taylor, Ramsey Campbell, Margot Lanigan, Laird Barron Edited by Ellen Datlow Performed by Daniel Thomas May Nikishi by Lucy Taylor Seasick and shivering, Thomas Blacksburg peered out from beneath the orange lifeboat canopy, watching helplessly as the powerful Benguela current swept him north up the coast of Namibia. For hours, he'd been within sight of the skeleton coast, that savage, wave-battered portion of the West African shore stretching between Angola to the north and Swakopmund to the south. Through ghostly filaments of fog that drifted around the boat, Blacksburg could make out the distant shore and the camel's back outline of towering, buff-colored dunes. To his horror, the land appeared to be receding. Having been brought tantalizingly close to salvation, the current was now tugging him back out into the fierce Atlantic. A leviathan wave powered up under the boat, permitting Blacksburg a view of houses strung out like pastel-colored beads. Impossible, he thought. This far north there was nothing but the vast, inhospitable terrain of the Namib Desert, an undulating dunescape stretching inland all the way to the flat, sun-blasted wasteland of the Atosha Pan. Blacksburg calculated his options and found them few. So suddenly and fiercely had the storm struck the night before that no distress call had gone out from the ill-fated yacht Obini. With the captain knocked overboard and the boat taking on water, Blacksburg and his employer, Oras de Groot, had been too busy trying to launch the lifeboat to radio for help. The Obimi wasn't expected in Angola until the following Friday. No one was looking yet. When they did look, there would be nothing to find. He was the sole survivor. The settlement in the dunes appeared to be his only chance. Checking to make sure the leather pouch strapped across his chest was still secure, he dove into the water. Hours passed before finally he hauled himself ashore and collapsed, half dead, onto the sand. The fog had lifted, revealing a narrow beach hemmed in between two vast oceans. To the west, the wild Atlantic, and to the east, an unbroken sea of dunes that rose in undulating waves of buff and ochre and gold. Silence reigned. The hiss and thunder of the surf was punctuated only by the cries of cormorants and the plaintive lamentations of gulls. Believing that he'd overshot the settlement he'd glimpsed from the boat, Blacksburg trudged south. Fatigue dogged him and acted on his brain like a psychedelic drug. Retinues of ghost crabs, fleet, translucent carrion eaters with eyes on stalks, seemed to scurry in his footprints with malevolent intent. Once he thought he glimpsed a spidery-limbed figure traversing the high dunes. But the image passed so quickly across his retina that it might have been anything. Strands of kelp animated by the incessant wind or a small swirling maelstrom of sand that his exhausted mind assigned a vaguely human form. The hyena slinking toward him, though, was no trickery of vision. A sloping, muscular beast with furrowed lips and seething, terry eyes, it angled languidly down the dune face, its brown and black fur hackled high, its hot gaze raw and lurid. Blacksburg took in the clamping power of those formidable jaws, and dread threaded through him like razor wire. He bent and scooped up a stone. Bugger off! he shouted, or tried to shout. What emerged from his parched throat was a wretched, sandpapery croak, the sound a mummy entombed for thousands of years might make if resurrected. The hyena edged closer. Blacksburg hurled the rock. It struck the hyena with a muted thunk, laying open a bloody gash on the tufted ear. The hyena's lips curled back, and it uttered a high-pitched whooping sound, so eerie and wild that the temperature on the windswept beach seemed to go ten degrees colder. He heard what sounded like a Range Rover trying to start on a low battery. 
But this false rescue was only the guttural cough out of the spotted hyena's broad muzzle. With a final saw-toothed snarl, the pot-bellied creature, which was seventy kilos if it was ten, wheeled around and loped back into the dunes that had spawned it. Exhaustion had so blunted Blacksburg's senses that he almost sleepwalked past the gray, wind-scoured facade of a two-story house, whose empty window frames and doorway stared down from atop a dune like empty eye sockets above a toothless mouth. Climbing up to investigate, he found a gutted shell, the bare interior carpeted with serpentines of sand, roof beams collapsed inward to reveal a square of azure sky. Gannets nested in the eaves. On the floor, a black tarantula held court atop a shattered chandelier. Spurred by a terrible intuition, he struggled up another dune until he could look down at the entire town. A pathetic row of derelict abodes, a sand-blasted gazebo where lovers might have lingered once, a church whose steeple had toppled off, the rusted carcass of a citroen from some forgotten era. The hoped-for sanctuary was a ghost town, a graveyard of rubble and stones. Stunned, despairing, he roamed amid the wreckage. The wind shifted suddenly, and he inhaled the mouth-watering aroma of cooking meat. The hot, heady aroma banged through his bloodstream like heroin. Saliva flooded his mouth. Half-dead synapses danced. Stumbling toward the scent, he crested another dune and looked down upon the beach to see a sinewy, dark-skinned old man using a stick to stir the enormous cast-iron boiki that rested atop a fire. The old fellow wore frayed trousers, a yellow ball cap, and a short-sleeved pink shirt. His left hand did the stirring. The right one, flopping by his side, was lacking all its fingers. Behind him, a girl in her late teens or early twenties was pulling a bottle of water from a canvas backpack on the ground. She uncapped the bottle and poured it into the poiki. She wore an ankle-length tan skirt, battered high tops, and a billowy red blouse. A brown bandana around her head held back a crown of wind-blown dreads. An old scar zigzagged like a lightning bolt between her upper lip and the corner of one eye. With feigned heartiness, Blacksburg slid and trotted down the dune, crying out, Uhalapo! It meant good afternoon in the Oshiwambo tongue. But judging from the old man's reaction, it might as well have been a threat to lop off his remaining fingers. The old man's eyes bulged, and he let loose a shriek of mortal fear. The woman had considerably more sangfroid. She held her ground, but snatched up a sharpened stick. My name is Blacksburg, he croaked, holding up his hands to show he meant no harm. I need help. The old man commenced a frenzied jabbering. The woman chattered back, and an animated exchange took place, virtually none of which Blacksburg understood. Finally, the old man fell silent, but he continued to appraise Blacksburg like a disgruntled wildebeest. Excuse my uncle, the woman said in meticulous schoolbook English. You frightened him. He thought you were an evil spirit come to kill us. No, just a poor lost wretch. He gestured at the empty water bottle. You wouldn't have another of those, would you? The woman took another bottle of water from the backpack and handed it to Blacksburg, who gulped greedily before eyeing the poitiki. Fine-smelling stew there, he said. What is it, some kind of wild game? Stock? Chutney? Maybe an ox tail or two? Using her stick, she speared a dripping slab of wild meat. Blacksburg fell upon it like a wolf. The meat was tough and stringy as a jackal's hide, but in his depleted state, he found it feast-worthy. Between mouthfuls, he gave a version of his plight, detailing the sinking of the Obimi and the loss of her captain, but speaking only vaguely of the one who had chartered the boat, his boss, Oras de Groot. The woman told him that her name was Amu, that she and the old man were from an Awambo village to the east, 
We'll take you there tomorrow. A tour bus stops by twice a week. You can get a ride to Windhoek. De Groot's largest diamond store was in Windhoek. Blacksburg had no intention of showing his face there. But what are you doing in a ghost town cooking up a feast? He said to redirect the conversation. Did you know that I was coming? What are you, witches? The girl snorted a bitter laugh. If I were a witch, I'd turn myself into a cormorant and fly up to Algiers or Gibraltar. I'd never come back. Something in her vehemence intrigued Blacksburg, who was no stranger to restlessness and discontent. Why do you say? The bite in her voice was like that of a dust storm. Do my uncle and I look rich to you? We live in a tiny village where the people raise cattle and goats. A good year means we get almost enough to eat. A bad year. Blacksburg saw no evidence of food shortage in the overflowing Boitki, but saw no need to point that out. With greasy fingers he gestured toward the forlorn remnants of the town. This place, what is it? What was it? Amu foraged deeper inside the backpack, bringing out a couple of Windhoek lagers. No ice, she said. You drink it warm? He grinned. I'll manage. Come walk with me. I'll tell you about the town. She took off at a brisk pace, high tops churning up small clouds of sand, hips, fetchingly a sway. Walking was the last thing he wanted to do, but Blacksburg wiped his hands on his trousers and headed up the dune behind her. It was a star dune, one of those sandy forms created by wind blowing from all directions, and it had Blacksburg's eye. Suddenly, with an agility and vigor that caught him by surprise, the old man lunged and seized his biceps in a fierce, one-handed grip, babbling wildly while pumping his mutilated hand. Nikishi, he repeated urgently. Blacksburg, a head taller and twenty kilos heavier, shook him off like a gnat. What's wrong with him? he asked, catching up to Amu. He's warning you about the evil spirits, the ones that take animal and human form. They like to call people by name to lure them out and kill them. She rolled her eyes. My uncle's Yampi. In our village, people laugh at him. Last week he grabbed a tourist lady's iPod and stomped it in the dirt because he thought that evil spirits called his name from the earbuds. She took a swig of lager, grimaced. Can't stand this stuff warm. She took off abruptly again, climbing nimbly while Blacksburg labored to keep up. They navigated a surreal dunescape where decaying buildings pillaged by time and the unceasing wind stood like remnants of a bombing. The larger buildings, the ones the desert hadn't yet reclaimed entirely, indicated a degree of bourgeois prosperity that must have in its heyday, seemed incongruous, perched as the town was on the edge of nothing, caught between the hostile Namib desert and the pounding surf. Amu must have read his thoughts. Forty years ago, she said, this was a busy diamond town called Wilhelmskopf. Water was trucked in once a week. There was a hospital, a school, plans for a community center, even a bowling alley. Everybody lived here. Afrikaners, Germans, Damara, and Owombo tribesmen. What happened? Blacksburg said, although he could guess. Many of the smaller diamond towns had petered out by the middle of the previous century, eclipsed by the huge discovery of diamonds in Oranjemund to the south. Of these, Kolmanskov, a ghost town just outside Luderitz, and now a major tourist attraction, was the most well-known. Amu's answer shocked him. In the late sixties, there were a lot of violent deaths. People found with their throats ripped out, torn apart by animals. Blacksburg thought of the hyena that had menaced him on the beach. Hyenas? Jekylls? Certainly. But fear spread that an Akishi and its offspring lived among these Wilhelmskopf people, changing into animal form at night to prey on them. 
a few superstitious fools panicked and turned on one another, accusing each other of sorcery. Eventually the town was abandoned. Can you believe such bosh? Now it belongs to the ghost crabs and the hyenas. Blacksburg finished off his beer and flung the empty bottle across the threshold of a faded cobalt house with sand piled inside up to the turquoise wainscoting. Lizards, stern and still as ancient gods, stared down from a piano's gutted innards and perched atop a cracked and broken set of shelves. A shiver rustled his spine. He looked away. Down below, in the purpling twilight, he could see the old man reaching into the poitki with his stick, stabbing slabs of bloody meat and flinging them out across the sand. Hey, he's throwing away the food. Amu looked away, embarrassed. I told you, he's mad. Years ago, my uncle was here collecting driftwood after a storm when he was attacked by what he thought was a Nikishi. He claims it called his name, and when he answered, it bit his fingers off and ate them while he begged for mercy. His mind hasn't been right since. He says the Nikishi told him he must come here after every storm and make a spirit offering of meat and beer, to thank the Nikishi for not eating all his fingers. Waste of good food, scoffed Blacksburg. This transforming rot. You believe it too? She looked affronted. Of course not. I'm educated. I was sent to Swakopmund Girls' School. I studied German and English, some science, learned about the world. That's why it's hard for me to live in an Awambo village. I know something bigger's out there. Blacksburg bit back a sarcastic jibe. What would someone who considered schooling in Swakopmund to be a cosmopolitan experience know about the wider world? This Awambo girl inhabited the most barren region of one of Africa's least populated countries. In Blacksburg's view, she was a half-step above savagery. How did you and your uncle get here? Trek across the desert? She arched a coal-black brow. No, we rode our camels. Look. Grabbing his hand, she pulled him along a passageway between a debris-strewn house and a derelict pavilion and laughed. For a second he almost expected to see two tethered dromedaries, but it was a black Toyota Hilux, sand-caked and mud-spattered, that was angled on the slope behind the buildings. Blacksburg gave the Hilux a covetous once-over. Nice-looking camel, this. Where do you gas it up? There's a petrol station for people going to the Itosha Pan, about forty kilometers from here and the safari companies that fly rich tourists in from Cape Town and Windhoek, they have way stations through the desert. Before he became ill, my uncle used to guide for one. That's how he got the jeep. I need to get to Angola, Blacksburg said. What say I buy it from you? She eyed him scornfully, his ragged salt-caked clothes, bare feet, disheveled hair. And use what for money? Shark's teeth? Ghost crabs? No need to mock me. Let me explain. He felt a sudden irresistible urge to touch her, as though some electrical energy pulsed inside her skin that his own body required for its sustenance. A few strands of hair had whipped loose from under the bandana, and he used that as an excuse, reaching out to tuck the hair back into place. To his dismay, she flinched as though he'd struck her. Sorry. He held up his hands, contrite. Look, about the jeep. I can pay you well. The jeep isn't mine. It belongs to the village. Loan it to me, then. Go with me as far as Luanda. After that, I'm on my own. But why should I help you? A fair question that I'd expect of you, a graduate of Swakopmund's girls' school. Here, let me show you something. His smile was confident, but his stomach corkscrewed at what he was about to do, betting everything on this girl's gullibility and greed. You say you wanted to see the wider world. What if I told you you could go anywhere you wanted and live like a movie star? What would you say to that? 
I'd say maybe you swallowed too much seawater, Blacksburg. That you're as crazy as my uncle. Crazy, huh? Look here. With a showman's flair, he reached inside his shirt, unhooked some clasps, and pulled out a leather wallet protector. Unzipping it, he produced two plastic baggies. Cup your hands. He unzipped one baggie and spilled into her palms a treasure trove of uncut stones. Even in the dimming light, they glittered like a fairy king's ransom. Amu's breath caught. She cradled the diamonds as though she held a beating heart. Her voice, when she finally spoke, was a reverential whisper. Onge P. What are you, a jewel thief? I'm a diamond dealer, he corrected brusquely. I was transporting these to a buyer in Luanda. He scooped the stones back into the baggie and opened up the next. These were a few museum-quality pieces from de Groot's private collection, several of which had been loaned out over the years to South African celebrities headed to New York and Cannes. Enjoying himself now, warming to his role, he plucked out a dazzling yellow diamond on a platinum chain. When he held it up, the sunlight put on a fire show. The facets blazed. Amu's dark eyes widened as he fastened it around her neck. In her inky irises were gold glints, a few grains of sand out of the Namib desert. It must be worth a fortune. A bit more than a used jeep, I imagine. If you get me to Luanda, it's yours to sell. Do we have an arrangement? She frowned and chewed her lower lip. What about my uncle? We can't let him go back to the village. Everyone will know I took the jeep and went off with an Oshilumbo. Blacksburg cringed a little at being called White Man and looked down onto the beach where the flames under the Boitki still danced. The old man paced a furious circle around the pot, raising his arms in wild supplication to whatever dark gods fueled his imagination. Silhouetted against the blood-red sun, the mutilated hand looked like a misshapen club. He took Amu's hand and brought her fingers to his lips tasting the meat and salts under the nails. Right then, let's leave your uncle to his demons. She laughed and pulled away, trotting along an alleyway between a half dozen tumbled down buildings, beckoning him to follow. When he caught up with her, she was framed in the empty doorway of a small stone house where, with a dancer's grace and the lewdness of a seasoned whore, she slowly peeled off the scarlet top and beige skirt. At the school in Swakopmund, she said, letting the blouse fall. The priest said I was too wild, too hungry for excitement, for boys and beer, for freedom. He said it's wrong to want too much, that it's a sin to be too hungry. In the fading light, her black eyes made promises both heartfelt and indecent. What about you, Blacksburg? Are you too hungry? For the first time in months, Blacksburg permitted himself a laugh of real delight. For a giddy moment, he actually romanced the notion of the two of them leaving Namibia together, a fantasy that Amu's reckless passion only fueled. She rode him with a mad abandon Blacksburg had experienced in only a few women, and then always prostitutes high on serious street drugs. If it was sex she'd been talking about when she asked him if it was a sin to be too hungry, then both were surely hellbound. Their rutting was as much attack as ardor. Blacksburg, glorying in pain both given and received, devoured her. Past and future fell away, until all that remained was her thrashing body and feral moans. The sea salt scent of her, and the fierce and biting sweetness of her teeth and tongue. He drank in the musky sweat that ran between her breasts and down her prominent ribs, and tangled his hands in the lush snarls of her dreadlocked mane. And when they rested, panting, sated, Blacksburg knew only that he wanted more. Later, she spooned her limber body around his and chuckled in his ear. 
Where will you go after you sell your diamonds? Don't lie to me. I know you're running. You wouldn't be so quick to trade a diamond for a jeep if you weren't a desperate man. He was surprised when the truth slipped out. England, maybe. My mother always said we had relatives in Cornwall. I might go there. Cornwall. She pronounced the word like one uttering an incantation. Maybe I'll go with you, my handsome Blacksburg. And for a few ecstatic moments, the idea of an impromptu adventure with this exotic woman moved Blacksburg deeply, fed into his desire to see himself as noble, heroic even, a survivor conquering the world by dint of ruthlessness and valor and self-will. The man he truly was, rich and powerful, like de Groot. Later, as he drifted toward sleep, he saw filaments of moonlight slant through the empty window and spill across her face. She was lovely, even with the scar. But what mesmerized him, what he could not tear his eyes from, was how the yellow diamond glimmered around that dark as bitter chocolate throat. Blacksburg dreamed about his mother. She stood outside the cottage in Cornwall before a running stream that he had seen in photographs. No longer gaunt, used up and gray as he remembered her, but young and spirited. Her voice was high and lilting, clear as birdsong, infused with a calm serenity that in her life he'd never known her to possess. She called to him, not in the sharp haranguing style that in life had been her nature, but with a serenity and sweetness. Blacksburg almost loved her then, an alien emotion he had seldom felt for her in life, for this woman who had been an Afrikaner whore. He woke up to the unholy cackling of hyenas and the taste of charred meat on his tongue. Amu was gone. For a second, panic gripped him, but the diamonds, still secure in their plastic baggies, were undisturbed. He pulled his pants on and went outside into a night no longer flecked with stars, but murky, swimming with long, damp tresses of fog. He felt like a diver floating along the bottom of the sea, enveloped in an endless, choking school of pale gray tubular fish. Peering down onto the beach, he tried to spot the old man's fire and thought he glimpsed the orange flare of a few remaining embers, but no sooner had he started to descend the dune than a low contralto rumbling halted him. The sound came from a dozen yards away, where the fog-swathed columns of the pavilion jutted from the gloom like a ghostly Parthenon. As he approached, he saw a nest of shadows low to the ground diverge and reconfigure, then caught a glimpse of a pink shirt and let himself exhale. The old man was asleep in the pavilion. The noise he'd heard undoubtedly was snoring. More movement, undulating, languid. He saw what looked to his uncertain eyes to be a wild crown of Medusa dreads whipped back and forth. A host of unwelcome images besieged his mind. But it was the hyena's glaring eyes and not its mane-like ruffled tail that finally made the scene before him recognizable. The hyena's eyes flashed then vanished into the fog only to reappear a few feet away. The grumbling, growling intensified. Blacksburg, shocked, motionless, counted five sets of eyes. A frightful snarling commenced as two of the hyenas, snapping wildly, fought over a choice morsel. Bits of skin and gristle flew. Blacksburg glimpsed a ragged nub of bone attached to a scrap of pink cloth, his breath caught in a stifled gasp. A hyena's head jerked up, and it raised its gory snout to test the wind. Blacksburg shoved away from the pavilion and plunged headlong into the fog. He tried to remember the location of the jeep, thinking he might be able to lock himself inside, but the drifting mist cast a surreal opaqueness across the dunescape. Nothing that he saw was recognizable the blank facades of the buildings as alike as weathered tombstones. Ahead, the murky outline of a crumbling two-story building floated up out of the fog. An empty window gaped. 
He hurled himself through it, tripped, and landed atop the piano he'd seen earlier, its ancient keys producing a wheezing bleat. Behind him, a sagging door led into a low hallway. The darkness was crypt black. He groped his way along, stumbling over obstacles, a plank, an empty drum of some kind, until he half fell into a small enclosed space, a storage room or closet. He huddled there, heart galloping, listening for the murderous whoops of the converging pack. Plaxburg? His own name sounded suddenly as alien and frightful as a curse. It floated on the hissing wind, at once as distant as the moon and close as his own breath. Amu's voice, or maybe just the scrape of wind-swept sand. He cleared his throat to answer and found that he was mute. They call people by name to lure them out. Although never in his life had Blacksburg been superstitious, now some atavistic fear crawled out of his reptilian brain and commandeered all else. He tried to tell himself his frantic mind was playing tricks, but an older knowledge told him what he feared the most, that what called to him was no hyena, but a shapeshifter, a nakishi, that would split him open like the old man from groin to sternum and feed while he lay dying. Blacksburg! The piano suddenly coughed out a great discordant cacophony, as though four clawed feet had leaped onto the keyboard and bounded off. The door he'd come through creaked, and then a single animal sent forth its infernal wail into the hollow building. At once, a clan of hyenas, some inside, others beyond the walls, took up the ungodly cry. Knowing he was seconds from being found and trapped, he bolted from his hiding place, raced up the hallway, and hurled himself through a window that was partially intact, crashing to the sand amidst a biting drizzle of shattered glass. Without pause, he got up and pounded down the dune face, arms pinwheeling, skidding wildly. The hyenas converged around him. The largest, boldest of the beasts fainted once before going for his throat. Its teeth snagged his shirt, taking with the fabric a strip of flesh from Blacksburg's ribs. He fell to one knee, one arm up to guard his jugular, the other to protect the pouch across his chest, even knowing beyond all doubt that both were lost to him. The ecstatic yips of the hyenas were suddenly drowned out by the roar of an approaching motor. The hillocks teetered at the top of the dune, then careened straight down the face, sand spewing out behind the tires, high beams punching through the fog. It slammed onto the beach, suspension screaming, bounced off the ground and veered toward the hyenas. The pack scattered. Blacksburg staggered to his feet as the jeep skidded to a halt beside him. Get in. Amu flung the door wide and Blacksburg launched himself inside, the jeep lurching into motion while his legs still dangled out the door. A hyena leaped, jaws snapping. He screamed and kicked out. The hyena twisted in midair and fell away. Blacksburg muscled the door closed. Amu gunned the engine and the jeep tore away through the fog. She drove like a witch, outdistancing the pack by many miles before she turned to Blacksburg and said gravely, I looked for you on foot at first. I called your name. I knew you were close by, but you didn't answer. I didn't hear you, Blacksburg lied, shame making him curt, resentful of her. They both knew he'd been afraid to answer, that in that desperate moment rationality had failed him. He'd believed the hyena pack to be Nikishis, and one of them was mimicking her voice. He was a fool and a coward, just as all along he knew his boss de Groot had judged him privately to be. In that moment, when he felt as though she'd seen into his soul and found him wanting, he made a harsh decision. He told her to stop the vehicle and switch places. He would drive. Later. When the midday sun was high and blazingly hot, Blacksburg decided they'd come far enough. He'd been driving for hours while Amu slept. 
Now he halted the hillocks in the middle of a sun-blasted stretch of desert, bleak and desolate as a medieval rendition of hell, shook her by the shoulder and said, Get out. She sat up, blinking groggily. What? What are you talking about? It's simple. End of the line. Get out. I don't understand. She looked around at the miles of barren, retina-searing whiteness. Is this a joke? He barked a bitter laugh. Did you really think I was taking you with me? I can get to Angola on my own. But I'll die out here. Yes, I imagine so. For a woman contemplating her very short future, she appeared strangely unmoved. But we are going to Luanda. One of us, not you. He held his hand out. And by the way, I want my diamond back. Then take it and be damned. Before Blacksburg could stop her, she yanked the diamond from around her neck and hurled it out the window as casually as if she were discarding a wad of gum. He swore and struck her across the head. The bandana came off. He saw the dried blood in her hair and the fresh blood flowing from the wound at the top of her ear. He stared at his hand, where her blood stained it. She dragged a finger pensively along the scar that ran along her cheek. You know how I got this. My uncle cut me with a knife. But I was merciful and let him live. Last night I was merciful again. I killed him before I fed his flesh to the hyenas. Using sheer force of will, Blacksburg hauled himself back from the brink of panic. You think you scare me? You're crazier than your uncle was. If I can kick my old boss out of a dinghy and into the sea, I can damn sure get rid of you. Now get the hell out of my jeep. She didn't budge. Wild hunger, wanton and insatiable, raged in her eyes. Her lips curled in a soulless smile. Yesterday I could have killed you on the beach, but I was curious about what kind of man you were, about what was in your heart. Now I know. And now you know me. Her voice was lush with malice, her face as she commenced her changing was radiant with cruelty. See me as I am, shrilled the Nikishi. At once her slashing teeth cleaved the soft white folds of his belly. She thrust her muzzle inside the wound, foraging for what was tastiest. The salty entrails were gobbled first, then the tender meat inside the bones. His life devoured in agonizing increments. Hours later, a hyena pup following a set of jeep tracks came across a human skull. It seized the trophy in its strong young jaws and headed back denward to gnaw the prize at leisure. Little America by Dan Sean First of all, here are the highways of America. Here are the states in sky blue, pink, pale green, with black lines running across them. Peter has a children's version of the map, which he follows as they drive. He places an X by the names of the towns they pass by, though most of the ones on his old map aren't there anymore. He sits, staring at the little cartoons of each state's products and services. Corn, oil wells, cattle, skiers. Secondly, here is Mr. Breeze himself. Here he is behind the steering wheel of the long, old Cadillac. His delicate hands are thin, reddish as if chapped. He wears a white shirt buttoned at the wrist and neck. His thinning hair is combed neatly over his scalp. His thin, skeleton head is smiling. He is bright and gentle and lively, like one of the hosts of the children's programs Peter used to watch on television. He widens his eyes and enunciates his words when he speaks. Third is Mr. Breeze's pistol. It is a Glock 19 9mm compact semi-automatic handgun, Mr. Breeze says. 
It rests enclosed in the glove box directly in front of Peter, and he imagines that it is sleeping. He pictures the muzzle, the hole where the bullet comes out, a closed eye that might open at any moment. Outside the abandoned gas station, Mr. Breeze stands with his skeleton head cocked, listening to the faintly creaking hinge of an old sign that advertises cigarettes. His face is expressionless, and so is the face of the gas station storefront. The windows are broken and patched with pieces of cardboard, and there is some trash, some paper cups and leaves and such, dancing in a ring on the oil-stained asphalt. The pumps are just standing there, dumbly. Hello, Mr. Breeze calls after a moment, very loudly. Anyone home? He lifts the arm of a nozzle from its cradle on the side of a pump and tries it. He pulls the trigger that makes the gas come out of the hose, but nothing happens. Peter walks alongside Mr. Breeze, holding Mr. Breeze's hand, peering at the road ahead. He uses his free hand to shade his eyes against the low, late afternoon sun. A little ways down are a few houses and some dead trees. A row of boxcars sitting on the railroad track. A grain elevator with its belfry rising above the leafless branches of elms. In a newspaper machine is a USA Today from August 6th, 2012, which was, Peter thinks, about two years ago, maybe. He can't quite remember. It doesn't look like anyone lives here anymore, Peter says at last. And Mr. Breeze regards him for a long moment in silence. At the motel, Peter lies on the bed face down, and Mr. Breeze binds his hands behind his back with a plastic tie. Is this too tight? Mr. Breeze says, just as he does every time, very concerned and courteous. And Peter shakes his head. No, he says, and he can feel Mr. Breeze adjusting his ankles so that they are parallel. He stays still as Mr. Breeze ties the laces of his tennis shoes together. You know that this is not the way that I want things to be, Mr. Breeze says, as he always does. It's for your own good. Peter just looks at him, with what Mr. Breeze refers to as his inscrutable gaze. Would you like me to read to you? Mr. Breeze asks. Would you like to hear a story? No, thank you, Peter says. In the morning, there is a noise outside. Peter is on top of the covers, still in his jeans and T-shirt and tennis shoes, still tied up. And Mr. Breeze is beneath the covers in his pajamas, and they both wake with a start. Beyond the window, there is a terrible racket. It sounds like they are fighting or possibly killing something. There is some yelping and snarling and anguish, and Peter closes his eyes as Mr. Breeze gets out of bed and springs across the room on his lithe feet to retrieve the gun. Shh. Mr. Breeze says, and mouths silently, Don't you move. He shakes his finger at Peter, No, 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 and then smiles and makes a little bow before he goes out the door of the motel with his gun at the ready. Alone in the motel room, Peter lies breathing on the cheap bed, his face down and pressed against the old polyester bedspread, which smells of mildew and ancient tobacco smoke. He flexes his fingers. His nails, which were once long and black and sharp, have been filed down to the quick by Mr. Breeze. For his own good, Mr. Breeze had said. But what if Mr. Breeze doesn't come back? What then? He will be trapped in this room. He will strain against the plastic ties on his wrist. He will kick and kick his bound feet, he will wriggle off the bed and pull himself to the door and knock his head against it. But there will be no way out. It will be very painful to die of hunger and thirst, he thinks. After a few minutes, Peter hears a shot, a dark firecracker echo that startles him and makes him flinch. Then Mr. Breeze opens the door. Nothing to worry about, Mr. Breeze says. Everything's fine. For a while, Peter had worn a leash and collar. The skin side of the collar had round metal nubs that touched Peter's neck and would give him a shock if Mr. Breeze touched a button on the little transmitter he carried. This is not how I want things to be, Mr. Breeze told him. I want us to be friends. 
I want you to think of me as a teacher or an uncle. Show me that you're a good boy, Mr. Breeze said, and I won't make you wear that any more. In the beginning, Peter had cried a lot, and he had wanted to get away, but Mr. Breeze wouldn't let him go. Mr. Breeze had Peter wrapped up tight and tied in a sleeping bag with just his head sticking out, wriggling like a worm in a cocoon, like a baby trapped in its mother's stomach. Even though Peter was nearly twelve years old, Mr. Breeze held him in his arms and rocked him and sang old songs under his breath and whispered, Shh, shh, shh. It's okay, it's okay, Mr. Breeze said. Don't be afraid, Peter. I'll take care of you. They are in the car again now, and it is raining. Peter leans against the window on the passenger side, and he can see the droplets of water inching along the glass, moving like schools of minnows. And he can see the clouds with their gray, foggy fingerlings almost touching the ground, and the trees bowed down and dripping. Peter, Mr. Breeze says after an hour or more of silence, Have you been watching your map? Do you know where we are? and Peter gazes down at the book Mr. Breeze had given him. Here are the highways, the states in their pale primary colors. Nebraska, Wyoming. I think we're almost halfway there, Mr. Breeze says. He looks at Peter, and his cheerful children's program eyes are careful. You can see him thinking something besides what he is saying. There is a way that an adult can look into you to see if you are paying attention, to see if you are learning. And Mr. Breeze's eyes scope across him, prodding and nudging. It's a nice place, Mr. Breeze says. A very nice place. You'll have a room of your own, a warm bed to sleep in, good food to eat, and you'll go to school. I think you'll like it. Hmm, Peter says and shudders. They are passing a cluster of houses now, some of them burned and still smoldering in the rain. There are no people left in those houses, Peter knows. They are all dead. He can feel it in his bones. He can taste it in his mouth. Also, out beyond the town in the fields of sunflowers and alfalfa, there are a few who are like him. Kids. They are padding stealthily along the rows of crops, their palms and foot soles pressing lightly along the loamy earth, leaving almost no track. They lift their heads, and their golden eyes glint. I had a boy once, Mr. Breeze says. They have been driving without stopping for hours now, listening to a tape of a man and some children singing. B-I-N-G-O, they are singing. Bingo was his name-o. A son, Mr. Breeze says. He wasn't so much older than you. His name was Jim. Mr. Breeze moves his hands vaguely against the steering wheel. He was a rock hound, Mr. Breeze says. He liked all kinds of stones and minerals, geodes he loved, and fossils. He had a big collection of those. Hmm, Peter says. It is hard to picture Mr. Breeze as a father, with his gaunt head and stick body and puppet mouth. It is hard to imagine what Mrs. Breeze must have looked like. Would she have been a skeleton like him, with a long black dress and long black hair, a spidery way of walking? Maybe she was his opposite. A plump young farm girl, blonde and ruddy cheeked, smiling and cooking things in the kitchen like pancakes. Maybe Mr. Breeze is just making it up. He probably didn't have a wife or son at all. What was your wife's name? Peter says at last, and Mr. Breeze is quiet for a long time. The rain slows, then stops as the mountains grow more distinct in the distance. Connie, Mr. Breeze says. Her name was Connie. By nightfall they have passed Cheyenne, a bad place, Mr. Breeze says, not safe. And they are nearly to Laramie, which has, Mr. Breeze says, a good organized militia and a high fence around the perimeter of the city. Peter can see Laramie from a long way off. 
The trunks of the light poles are as thick and tall as sequoias, and at their top a cluster of halogen lights, a screaming of brightness. And Peter knows he doesn't want to go there. His arms and legs begin to itch, and he scratches with his sore, clipped nails, even though it hurts just to touch them to skin. Stop that, please, Peter, Mr. Breeze says softly, and when Peter doesn't stop, he reaches over and gives Peter a flick on the nose with his finger. Stop, Mr. Breeze says, right now. There are blinking yellow lights ahead, where a barrier has been erected, and Mr. Breeze slows the Cadillac as two men emerge from behind a structure made of logs and barbed wire and pieces of cars that have been sharpened into points. The men are soldiers of some kind, carrying rifles, and they shine a flashlight in through the windshield at Peter and Mr. Breeze. Behind them, the high chain fence makes shadow patterns across the road as it moves in the wind. Mr. Breeze puts the car into park and reaches across and takes the gun from its resting place in the glove box. The men are approaching slowly, and one of them says very loudly, Step out of the car, please, sir. And Mr. Breeze touches his gun to Peter's leg. Be a good boy, Peter, Mr. Breeze whispers. Don't you try to run away or they will shoot you. Then Mr. Breeze puts on his broad, bright puppet smile. He takes out his wallet and opens it so that the men can see his identification, so that they can see the gold seal of the United States of America, the glinting golden stars. He opens his door and steps out. The gun is tucked into the waistband of his pants, and he holds his hands up loosely, displaying the wallet. He shuts the door with a thunk, leaving Peter sealed inside the car. There is no handle on the passenger side of the car, so Peter cannot open his door. If he wanted to, he could slide across to the driver's seat and open Mr. Breeze's door, and roll out onto the pavement and try to scramble as fast as he could into the darkness. And maybe he could run fast enough, zigzagging so that the bullets they'd shoot would only nip the ground behind him, and he could find his way into some kind of brush or forest, and run and run until the voices and the lights were far in the distance. But the men are watching him very closely. One man is holding his flashlight so that the beam shines directly through the windshield and onto Peter's face, and the other man is staring at Peter as Mr. Breeze speaks and gestures, speaks and gestures like a performer on television who is selling something for kids. But the man is shaking his head, no, no. I don't care what kind of papers you got, mister, the man says. There's no way you're bringing that thing through these gates. Peter used to be a real boy. He can remember it. A lot of it is still very clear in his mind. I pledge allegiance to the flag and knick-knack paddywhack, give a dog a bone, this old man goes rolling home, and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Now I know my ABCs, next time won't you sing with me? And yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. And he remembers the house with the big trees in front, riding a scooter along the sidewalk, his foot pumping and making momentum. The bug in a jar, cicada, coming out of its shell and the green wings. His mom and her two braids. The cereal in a bowl, pouring milk on it. His dad flat on the carpet, climbing on his dad's back. Dog pile! He can still read. The letters come together and make sounds in his mind. When Mr. Breeze asked him, he found he could still say his telephone number and address and the names of his parents. Mark and Rebecca Krolik, he said. 2134 Overlook Boulevard, South Bend, Indiana, 46601. Very good, Mr. Breeze said. Wonderful. And then Mr. Breeze said, where are they now, Peter? Do you know where your parents are? Mr. Breeze pulls back from the barricade of Laramie and the gravel splutters out from their tires, and in the rearview mirror, Peter can see the men with their guns in the red taillights and dust. Damn it, Mr. Breeze says, and slaps his hand against the dashboard. Damn it! I knew I should have put you in the trunk. And Peter says nothing. 
He has never seen Mr. Breeze angry in this way, and it frightens him. The red splotches on Mr. Breeze's skin, the scent of adult rage, though he is also relieved to be moving away from those big halogen lights. He keeps his eyes straight ahead and his hands folded in his lap, and he listens to the silence of Mr. Breeze unraveling. He listens to the highway moving beneath them and watches as the yellow dotted lines at the center of the road are pulled endlessly beneath the car. For a while, Peter pretends that they are eating the yellow lines. After a time, Mr. Breeze seems to calm. Peter, he says, two plus two. Four, Peter says softly. Four and four. Eight. Eight and eight. Sixteen. Peter says, and he can see Mr. Breeze's face in the bluish light that glows from the speedometer. It is the cold profile of a portrait like the pictures of people that are on money. There is the sound of the tires, the sound of velocity. You know, Mr. Breeze says at last, I don't believe that you're not human. Hmm, Peter says. He thinks this over. It's a complicated sentence, more complicated than math, and he's not sure he knows what it means. His hands rest in his lap, and he can feel his poor, clipped nails tingling as if they were still there. Mr. Breeze said that after a while he will hardly remember them. But Peter doesn't think this is true. When we have children, Mr. Breeze says, they don't come out like us. They come out like you, Peter and some of them even less like us than you are. It's been that way for a few years now. But I have to believe that these children, at least some of these children, aren't really so different because they are a part of us, aren't they? They feel things. They experience emotions. They are capable of learning and reason. I guess, Peter says, because he isn't sure what to say. There is a kind of look an adult will give you when they want you to agree with them, and it is like a collar they put on you with their eyes, and you can feel the little nubs against your neck where the electricity will come out. Of course, he is not like Mr. Breeze, nor the men that held the guns at the gates of Laramie. It would be silly to pretend, but this is what Mr. Breeze seems to want. Maybe, Peter says and he watches as they pass a green luminescent sign with a white arrow that says, Exit. He can remember the time that his first tooth came out, and he put it under his pillow in a tiny bag that his mother had made for him, which said, Tooth Fairy. But then the teeth began to come out very quickly after that, and the sharp ones came in. Not like mother or father's teeth, and the fingernails began to thicken, and the hair on his forearms and chin and back, and his eyes changed color. Tell me, says Mr. Breeze, you didn't hurt your parents, did you? You loved them, right? Your mom and dad? After that, they are quiet again. They are driving and driving, and the darkness of the mountain roads closes in around them. The shadows of pine trees fussing with their raiments the grim shadows of solid, staring boulders, the shadows of clouds lapping across the moon. You loved them, right? Peter leans his head against the passenger window and closes his eyes for a moment, listening to the radio as Mr. Breeze moves the knob slowly across the dial. Static. 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 Man crying. Static. Static. Very distant Mexican music fading in and out. Static. Man preaching fervidly. Static. Static. And then silence as Mr. Breeze turns it off, and Peter keeps his eyes closed, tries to breathe slow and heavy like a sleeping person does. You loved them, right? And Mr. Breeze is whispering under his breath. A long stream of wisps nothing recognizable. When Peter wakes, it's almost daylight. They are parked at a rest stop. Peter can see the sign that says, Wagon Hound Rest Area, sitting in a pile of white rocks. 
He can see the outlines of the little buildings, one for men, one for women, and there is some graffiti painted against the brick. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. And the garbage cans tipped over and strewn about, the many fast food bags ripped open and torn apart and licked clean, and then the remnants licked again later, hopefully. And the openings of the crushed soda cans tasted, hopefully, and the other detritus examined, sniffed through, scattered. There is a sound nearby. Sounds. A few of them creeping closer. An old plastic container is being nosed along the asphalt, prodded for whatever dried bit of sugar might still adhere to the interior. Peter hears it. It rolls. Thock, thock, thock. Then stops. One has picked it up. One is eyeing it, the hardened bit of cola at the bottom. He hears the crunch of teeth against the plastic bottle, and then the sound of loud licking and mastication. And then one is coming near to the car, where he and Mr. Breeze are supposed to be sleeping. One leaps up onto the front of the Cadillac, naked, on all fours, and lets out a long stream of pee onto the hood of the car. The car bounces as the boy lands on it, and there is the thick, splattering sound, and then the culprit bounds away. That shakes Mr. Breeze awake. He jerks up, scrabbling, and briefly Peter can see Mr. Breeze's real face. Hard-eyed and teeth bared. Nothing kindly, nothing from television, nothing like a friendly puppet. And Mr. Breeze clutches his gun and swings it in a circle around the car. What the fuck? Mr. Breeze says. For a minute he breathes like an animal in tight, short gasps. He points his gun at the windows, front, back, both sides. Peter makes himself small in the passenger seat. Afterward, Mr. Breeze is unnerved. They start driving again right away, but Mr. Breeze doesn't put his gun in the glove box. He keeps it in his lap and pats it from time to time like it is a baby he wants to stay asleep. It takes him a while to compose himself. Well, he says at last, and he gives Peter his thin-lipped smile. That was a bad idea, wasn't it? I suppose so, Peter says. He watches as Mr. Breeze gives the gun a slow, comforting stroke. Shh, there, there. Mr. Breeze's friendly face is back on now, but Peter can see how the fingertips are trembling. You should have said something to me, Peter, Mr. Breeze says in a kindly but reproachful voice. Mr. Breeze raises an eyebrow. He frowns with mild disappointment. You were asleep, Peter says, and clears his throat. I didn't want to wake you up. That was very thoughtful of you, Mr. Breeze says, and Peter glances down at his map. He looks at the dots. Wamsutter, Bitter Creek, Rock Springs, Little America, Evanston. How many of them were there, do you think, Peter? Mr. Breeze says. A dozen? Peter shrugs. A dozen means twelve. Mr. Breeze says. I know. So, do you think there were twelve of them? Or more than twelve of them? I don't know, Peter says. More than twelve? I should say so, Mr. Breeze says. I would venture to guess that there were about fifteen of them, Peter. And he is quiet for a little while, as if thinking about the numbers, and Peter thinks about them too. When he thinks about one dozen, he can picture a container of eggs. When he thinks about fifteen, he can picture a one and a five standing together side by side, holding hands like brother and sister. You're not like them, Peter, Mr. Breeze whispers. I know you know that. You're not one of them, are you? What is there to say? Peter stares down at his hands, at his sore, shaved fingernails. He runs his tongue along the points of his teeth. He feels the hard, broad muscles of his shoulders flex, the bristled hairs on his back rubbing uncomfortably against his T-shirt. Listen to me, says Mr. Breeze, his voice soft and stern and deliberate. Listen to me, Peter. You are a special boy. People like me travel all over the country looking for children just like you. You're different. You know you are. 
those things back there at the rest stop? You're not like them. You know that, don't you? After a time, Peter nods. You loved them, right? Peter thinks. And he can feel his throat tighten. He hadn't meant to kill them, not really. Most of the time he forgets that it happened, and even when he does remember, he can't recall why it happened. It was as if his mind was asleep for a while, and then when he woke up there was the disordered house, as if a burglar had turned over every object looking for treasure. His father's body was in the kitchen, and his mother's was in the bedroom. A lot of blood, a lot of scratches and bites on her, and he put his nose against her hair and smelled it. He lifted her limp hand and pressed the palm of it against his cheek and made it pet him. Then he made it hit him in the nose and the mouth. Bad, he had whispered. Bad, bad. It's going to be better once we get to Salt Lake, Mr. Breeze says. It's a special school for children like you, and I know you're going to enjoy it so much. You're going to make a lot of new friends, and you're going to learn so much, too, about the world. You'll read books and work with a calculator and a computer, and you'll do some things with art and music. And there will be counselors there who will help you with your feelings. Because the feelings are just feelings. They are like weather. They come and go. They're not you, Peter. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Peter says. He stares out to where the towering white-yellow butte cliffs have been cut through to make room for the road, and the metal guardrail unreels beside them, and the sky is a glowing, empty blue. He blinks slowly. If he goes to this school, will they make him tell about his mom and dad? Maybe it will be all right. Maybe he will like it there. Maybe the other children will be mean to him and the teachers won't like him either. Maybe he is special. Will his fingernails always hurt like this? Will they always have to be cut and filed? Listen, Mr. Breeze says, we're coming up on a tunnel. It's called the Green River Tunnel. You can probably see it on your map, but I want to tell you that there have been some problems with these tunnels. It's easy to block the tunnels from either end once a car is inside it, so I'm going to speed up, and I'm going to go very, very fast when we get there. Okay? I just want you to be prepared. I don't want you to get alarmed, okay? Okay, Peter says, and Mr. Breeze smiles broadly and nods, and then without another word they begin to accelerate. The guardrail begins to slip by faster and faster until it is nothing but a silver river of blur, and then the mouths of the tunnels appear before them, one for the left side of the road, one for the right, maybe not mouths, but instead a pair of eyes, two black sockets beneath a ridged hill. And Peter can't help himself, he tightens his fingers against his legs, even though it hurts. When they pass beneath the concrete arches, there is a soft woof sound, as if they've gone through the membrane of something, and then suddenly there is darkness. He can sense the curved roof of the tunnel over them, a rib cage of dark against dark flicking overhead, and the echo of the car as it speeds up faster and faster. A long crescendo as the opening in the distance grows wider and wider, and the opening behind them grows smaller. But even as the car quickens, Peter can feel time slowing down, so that each rotation of tire is like the click of the second hand of a clock. There are kids in the tunnel. Twenty? No, thirty, maybe. He can sense the warm bodies of them as they flinch and scrabble up the walls of the tunnel, as they turn and begin to chase after the car's taillights, as they drop stones and bits of metal down from their perches somewhere in the tunnel's concrete rafters. Yeah, they call. Yeah, And their voices make Peter's fingers ache. In front of them, the whole of daylight spreads open brighter, a corona of whiteness, and Peter can only see the blurry shadow skeletons of the kids as they leap in front of the car. They must be going a hundred miles an hour or more when they hit the boy. The boy may be eight or nine, Peter can't tell. There is only the imprint of a contorted face, and the cry he lets out, a thin, wiry body leaping. 
Then a heavy thump as the bumper connects with him, and a burst of blood blinds the windshield. And they hear the clunking tumble of the body across the roof of the car and onto the pavement behind them. Mr. Breeze turns on the windshield wipers, and cleaning fluid squirts up as the wipers squeak across the glass. The world appears through the smeared arcs the wipers make. There is a great expanse of valley and hills and wide open sky. We're getting very low on gas, Mr. Breeze says, after they've driven for a while in silence. And Peter doesn't say anything. There's a place up ahead. It used to be safe, but I'm not sure if it's safe anymore. Oh, Peter says. You'll tell me if it's safe, won't you? Yes, Peter says. It's called Little America. Do you know why? Mr. Breeze looks at him. His eyes are softly sad, and he smiles just a little, wanly. And it's tragic. But it's also okay, because that boy wasn't special, not like Peter is special. It is something to be left behind us, says Mr. Breeze's expression. Peter shrugs. It's very interesting. Mr. Breeze says, because there once was an explorer named Richard Byrd, and he went into Antarctica, which is a frozen country far to the south, and he made a base on the Ross Ice Shelf, south of the Bay of Wales, and he named his base Little America. And so then, later, much, much later, they made a motel in Wyoming, and because it was so isolated, they decided to call it by the same name. And they used a penguin as their mascot, because penguins are from Antarctica, and when I was a kid there were a lot of signs and billboards that made the place famous. Oh, Peter says, and he can't help but think of the kid, the kid saying, Yeah! They are driving along very slowly, because it is still hard to see out of the windshield, and the windshield wiper fluid has stopped working. It makes its mechanical sound, but... No liquid comes out anymore. It is a kind of oasis, this place, this little America. A great, huge parking lot and many gas pumps and a store and beyond that a motel with a green concrete dinosaur standing in the grass, a baby brontosaurus, a little taller than a man. It is the kind of landscape they like. The long, wide, strip-mall buildings with their corridors of shelves, the cave-like concrete passageways of enormous interstate motels with their damp carpets and moldering beds, the little alcoves where ice machines and tall soda vendors may still be inexplicably running, the parking lots where the abandoned cars provide shelter and hiding places better than a forest of trees. There are a lot of them around here, I think. Mr. Breeze says, as they settle in next to a pump. Above them there is a kind of plastic metal canopy, and they sit for a while under its shade. Peter can sense that Mr. Breeze is uncertain. How many of them are there, do you think? Mr. Breeze says very casually, and Peter closes his eyes. More than a hundred? Mr. Breeze says. Yes, Peter says, and he looks at Mr. Breeze's face, surreptitiously, and it is the face of a man who has to jump a long distance but does not want to. Yes, he says, more than a hundred. He can feel them. They are peering out from the travel center building and the windows of the boarded-up motel and old abandoned cars in the parking lot. If I get out of the car and try to pump gas, will they come? Mr. Breeze says. Yes, Peter says. They will come very fast. Okay, Mr. Breeze says. And the two of them are silent for a long time. The face of Mr. Breeze is not the face of a television man or a skeleton or a puppet. It is the elusive face that adults give you when they are telling you a lie, for your own good, they think, when there is a big secret that they are sorry about. Always remember, Peter's mother said, I loved you even. I want you to hold my gun. Mr. Breeze says. Do you think you can do that, if they start coming? And Peter tries to look at his real face. Could it be said that Mr. Breeze loved him, even if? We won't make it to Salt Lake unless we get gas, Mr. Breeze says, and Peter watches as he opens the door of the car. 
Wait, Peter thinks. Peter had meant to ask Mr. Breeze about his son, about Jim, the rock hound. You killed him, didn't you? Peter had wanted to ask, and he expected that Mr. Breeze would have said yes. Mr. Breeze would have hesitated for a while, but then finally he would have told the truth because Mr. Breeze was that kind of person. And what about me? Peter wanted to ask. Would you kill me too? And Mr. Breeze would have said yes. Yes, of course, if I needed to. But you would never put me in that situation, would you, Peter? You aren't like the others, are you? Peter thinks of all this as Mr. Breeze steps out of the car. He can sense the other kids growing alert, with their long black nails and sharp teeth, with their swift, jumping muscles and bristling hairs. He can see the soft, slow movement of Mr. Breeze's legs. How easy it would be to think, pray. How warm and full of pumping juice were his sinews. How tender was his skin, the cheeks of his face like a peach. He knew that they would converge down upon him so swiftly that there wouldn't be time for him to cry out. He knew that they could not help themselves, even as Peter himself could not help himself. His mom, his dad. Wait, he wanted to say, but it happened much faster than he expected. Wait, he thinks. He wants to tell Mr. Breeze. I want. I want? But there isn't really any time for that. Oh, Mom, I am a good boy, he thinks. I want to be a good boy. A Natural History of Autumn by Jeffrey Ford on a blue afternoon in autumn, Riku and Michi drove south from Numazu in his silver convertible along the coast of the Izu Peninsula. The temperature was mild for the end of October, and the air was clear, the sun glinting off Suruga Bay. She wore sunglasses and, to protect her hair, a yellow scarf with a design of orange butterflies. He wore driving gloves, a black dress shirt, a loosened white tie. The car, the open road... The rush of the wind made it impossible to converse, and so for miles she watched the bay to their right, and he the rising slopes of maple and pine to their left. Just outside the town of Dogashima, a song came on the radio. Just you, just me, and they turned to look at each other. She waited for him to smile. He did. She smiled back, and then he headed inland to search for the hidden onsen, Inugami. They'd met the previous night at The Limit, an upscale hostess bar. Riku's employer had a tab there, and he was free to use it when in Numasu. Her conversation had sounded rote, like a script, like a script, her flattery grotesquely opulent and therefore flat. The instant he saw Michi, though, in her short black dress with a look of uncertainty in her eyes, he knew it would be a different experience. He ordered a bottle of Nikioichi and two glasses. She introduced herself. He stood and bowed. They were in a private room at a polished table of blonde wood. The chairs were high-backed and upholstered like thrones. To their right was an open-air view of pines and the coast. She waited for him to smile, and eventually he did. She smiled back and told him, I'm writing a book. Riku said, Aren't you supposed to tell me how handsome I am? Your hair is perfect, she said. He laughed. I see. I'm writing a book, she said again. I decided to make a study of something. You're a scientist, he said. We're all scientists, she said. We watch and listen, take in information, process it. We spin theories by which we live. What if they're false? What if they're not? She said. He shook his head and took a drink. They sat in silence for a time. She stared out past the pines, sipping her whiskey. He stared at her. Tell me about your family, said Riku. She told him about her dead father, her ill mother, her younger sister and brother, but when she inquired about his parents, he said, Okay, tell me about your book. 
I decided to study a season, and since autumn is the season I'm in, it would be autumn. It's a natural history of autumn. You've obviously been to the university, he said. She shook her head. No, I read a lot to pass the time between clients. How much have you written? Nothing yet. I'm researching now, taking notes. Do you go out to Thousand Tree Beach and stare at Fuji in the morning? Your sarcasm is intoxicating, she said. He filled her glass. No, I do my research here. I ask each client what autumn means to him. And they tell you? She nodded. Some just want me to say how big their biceps are, but most sit back and really think about it. The thought of it makes all the white-haired Ojisans smile, and businessmen cry, and young men a little scared. A lot of it is the same. Just images. The colorful leaves, the clear cold mornings by the bay, a certain pet dog, a childhood friend, a drunken knight. But sometimes they tell me whole stories. What kind of stories? A very powerful businessman, one of the other hostesses swore he was a master of the five elements, once told me his own love story about a young woman he had an affair with. It began on the final day of summer, lasted only as long as the following season, and ended in the snow. What did you learn from that story? What did you put in your notes? I recorded his story as he'd told it, and afterward wrote, The Story of a Ghost. Why a ghost? he asked. I forget, she said. And I lied. I attended Waseda University for two years before my father died. You didn't have to tell me, he said. I knew when you told me you called the businessman's story the story of a ghost. Pretentious? she asked. He shrugged. Maybe, she said and smiled. Forget about that, said Riku. I will top that Makenu businessman's exquisite melancholy by proposing a field trip. He sat forward in his chair and touched the tabletop with his index finger. My employer recently rewarded me for a job well done and suggested I use, whenever I like, a private onsen he has an arrangement with down in Izu. I need only call a few hours in advance. A field trip? she said. What will we be researching? Autumn, the red and yellow leaves, the places out in the woods on a mountainside, hidden and very old-fashioned, no frills. I propose a dohan, an overnight journey to the onsen in Ugami. A date, she said, and our attentions will only be on autumn, nothing else? You can trust me when I say that is entirely up to you. Your hair inspires confidence, she said, you can arrange things with the house on the way out. I intend to be in your book, he said, and prevented himself from smiling. After hours of winding along the rims of steep cliffs and bumping down tight dirt paths through the woods, the silver car pulled to a stop in a clearing in front of a large, slightly sagging farmhouse, Minka style, built of logs with a thatched roof. Twenty yards to the left of the place there was a sizable garden filled with dying sunflowers, ten-foot stalks, their heads bowed. To the right of the house there was a slate path that led away into the pines. The golden late afternoon light slanted down on the clearing, shadows beginning to form at the tree line. We're losing the day, said Riku. We'll have to hurry. Michi got out of the car and stretched. She removed her sunglasses and stood still for a moment, taking in the cool air. I have your bag, said Riku, and shut the trunk. As they headed for the house, two figures appeared on the porch. One was a small old woman with white hair, wearing monpe pants and an indigo katazome jacket with a design of white flames. Next to her stood what Michi at first mistook for a pony. The sight of the animal surprised her, and she stopped walking. Riku went on ahead. Grandmother Chinatsu, he said, and bowed. Your employer has arranged everything with me. Welcome, she said. A small, wrinkled hand with dirty nails appeared from within the sleeve of the jacket. She beckoned to Michi. Come, 
my dear, don't be afraid of my pet. Oh, no, he doesn't bite. She smiled and waved her arm. As Michi approached, she bowed to Grandmother Chinatsu, who only offered a nod. The instant the young woman's foot touched the first step of the porch, the dog gave a low growl. The old lady wagged a finger at the creature and snapped. Yemity! Then she laughed. Low and gruff, the sound at odds with her diminutive size. She extended her hand and helped Michi up onto the porch. Come in, she said and led them into the farmhouse. Michi was last in line. She turned to look at the dog. Its coat was more like curly human hair than fur. She winced in disgust. A large, flattened, pug face, no snout to speak of, black eyes, sharp ears, and a thick bottom lip bubbling with drool. Oh no, she said, and bowed slightly in passing. As she stepped into the shadow beyond the doorway, she felt the dog's nose press momentarily against the back of her dress. In the main room there was a rock fireplace within which a low flame licked two maple logs. Above hung a large paper lantern, orange with white blossoms, shedding a soft light in the center of the room. The place was rustic, wonderfully simple. All was wood, the walls, the ceiling, the floor. There were three ancient carved wooden chairs gathered around a low table off in an alcove at one side of the room. Grandmother led them down a hallway to the back of the place. They passed a room on the left, its screen shut. At the next room, the old lady slid open the panel and said, The toilet! Further on, they came to two rooms, one on either side of the hallway. She let them know who was to occupy which by mere nods of her head. The bath is at the end of the hall, she said. Their rooms were tatami style straw mats and a platform bed with a futon mattress in the far corner. They undressed, put on robes and sandals, and met in the hallway. As they passed through the main room of the house, Ono stirred from his spot by the fireplace, looked up at them, and snorted. Easy, easy, said Riku to the creature. He stepped aside and let Michi get in front of him. Once out on the porch, she said, Ono is a little scary. Only a little? he asked. Grandmother appeared from within the plot of dying sunflowers and called that there were towels in the shed out by the spring. Riku waved to her as he and Michi took the slate path into the pines. Shadows were rising beneath the trees and the sky was losing its last blue to an orange glow. Leaves littered the path and the temperature had dropped. The scent of pine was everywhere. Curlews whistled from the branches above. Are you taking notes? He called ahead to her. She stopped and waited for him. Which do you think is more autumnal? The leaves, the dying sunflowers, or Grandmother Chinatsu? Too early to tell, he said. I'm withholding judgment. Another hundred yards down the winding path, they came upon the spring, nearly surrounded by pines except for one spot with a view of a small meadow beyond. Steam rose from the natural pool, curling up in the air, reminding Michi of the white flames on the old lady's jacket. At the edge of the water, closest to the slate path, there was an ancient stonework, a crude bench, a stacked rock wall covered with moss, six foot by four, from which a thin waterfall splashed down into the rising heat of the onsen. Lovely, said Michi. Riku nodded. She left him and moved down along the side of the spring. He looked away as she stepped out of her sandals and removed her robe, which she hung on a nearby branch. He heard her sigh as she entered the water. When he removed his robe, her face was turned away, as if she were taking in the last light on the meadow. Meanwhile, Riku was taking Michi in, her slender neck, her long black hair and how it lay on the curve of her shoulders, her breasts. Are you getting in? she asked. He silently eased down into the warmth. When Michi turned to look at him, she immediately noticed the tattoo on his right shoulder. 
a vicious swamp eel with rippling fins and needle fangs, and a long body that wrapped around Riku's back. It was the color of the moss on the rocks of the waterfall. Riku noticed her glancing at it. He also noticed the smoothness of her skin and that her nipples were erect. Who is your employer? she asked. He's a good man, he said, and lowered himself into a crouch so that only his head was above water. Now pay attention, he said, and looked out at the meadow, which was already in twilight. To what? she asked, also sinking down into the water. He didn't respond as they remained immersed for a long time, just two heads floating on the surface, staring silently and listening, steam rising around them. At last light, when the air grew cold, the curlews lifted from their branches and headed for Australia. Riku stood, moved to a different spot in the spring, and crouched down again. Nietzsche moved closer to him. A breeze blew through the pines. A cricket sang in the dark. Was there any inspiration? he asked. I'm not sure, she said. It's time for you to tell me your story of autumn. She drew closer to him, and he backed up a step. I don't tell stories, he said. As brief as you want, but something, she said, and smiled. He closed his eyes and said, Okay. The autumn I was seventeen I worked on one of the fishing boats out of Numazu. We were out for horse mackerel. On my journey we were struck by a rogue wave, a giant that popped up out of nowhere. I was on the deck when it hit and we were swamped. I managed to grab a rope and it took all my strength not to be drawn overboard. The water was so cold and powerful. I was sure I would die. Two men did get swept away and were never found. That's my natural history of autumn. She moved forward and put her arms around him. They kissed. He drew his head back and whispered in her ear. When I returned to shore that autumn, I quit fishing. She laughed and rested her head on his shoulder. They dined by candlelight in their robes in the alcove off the main room of the farmhouse. Grandmother Chinatsu served, and Ono followed a step behind, so that every time she leaned forward to put a platter on the table, there was the dog's leering face, tongue drooping. The main course was thin slices of raw mackerel with grated ginger and chopped scallions. They drank sake. Michi remarked on the appearance of mackerel after Riku's story. Most definitely a sign, he said. They discussed the things they each saw and heard at the spring as the sake bottle emptied. It was well past midnight when the candle burned out and they went down the hall to his room. Three hours later, Michi woke in the dark, still a little woozy from the sake. Riku woke when she sat up on the edge of the bed. Are you all right? he asked. I have to use the toilet. She got off the bed and lifted her robe from the mat. Slipping into it, she crossed the room. When she slid back the panel, a dim light entered. A lantern hanging in the center of the hallway ceiling bathed the corridor in a dull glow. Michi left the panel open and headed up the hallway. Riku lay back and immediately dozed off. It seemed only a minute to him before Michi was back, shaking him by the shoulder to wake up. She left the panel open and he could see her face. Her eyes were wide, the muscles of her jaw tense, a vein visibly throbbing behind the pale skin of her forehead. She was breathing rapidly, and he could feel the vibration of her heartbeat. Get me out of here, she said in a harsh whisper. What's wrong, he said, and moved quickly to the edge of the bed. She kneeled on the mattress next to him and grabbed his arm tightly with both hands. We've got to leave, she said. He shook his head and ran his fingers through his hair. It wasn't perfect anymore. He carefully removed his arm from her grip and checked his watch. It's 3 a.m., he said. You want to leave? I demand you take me out of this place now. What happened? he asked. Either you take me now or I'll leave on foot. He gave a long sigh and stood up. I'll be ready in a minute, he said. 
She went across the corridor to her room and gathered her things together. When they met in the hallway, bags in hand, he asked her, Do you think I should let Grandmother Chinatsu know we're leaving? Definitely not, she said, on the verge of tears. She grabbed him with her free hand and dragged him by the shirt sleeve down the hallway. As they reached the main room of the house, she stopped and looked warily around. Was it the dog? he whispered. The coast was apparently clear, for she then dragged him outside, down the porch steps, to the silver car. Get in, he said. I have to put the top up. It's too cold to drive with it down. Just hurry, she said, stowing her overnight bag. She slid into the passenger seat just as the car top was closing. He got in behind the wheel and reached over to latch the top on her side before doing his. Michi's window was down and she heard the creaking of planks from the porch. She leaned her head toward her shoulder and looked into the car's side mirror. There, in the full moonlight, she could see Grandmother Chinatsu and Ono. The old lady was waving and laughing. Drive! she shrieked. Riku hit the start button, put the car in gear, and they were off into the night racing down a rutted dirt road at fifty. Once the farmhouse was out of sight, he let up on the gas. You've got to tell me what happened, he said. She was shivering. Get us out of the woods first, she said, to a highway. I can't see a thing and I don't remember all the roads, he said. We might end up lost. He drove for more than an hour before he found a road made of asphalt. His car had been brutalized by the crude paths and branches jutting along the roadway. There would be a hundred scratches on his doors. During that entire time, Michi stared ahead through the windshield, breathing rapidly. We're on a main road. Tell me what happened, he said. I got up to use the toilet, she said. And I did. But when I stepped back out into the hallway to return, I heard a horrible grunting noise. I swear it sounded like someone was choking Grandmother Chinatsu to death in her room. I moved along the wall to the entrance. The panel was partially open and there was a light inside. The noise had stopped, so I peered in and there was the shriveled old lady on her hands and knees on the floor, naked. Her forearms were trembling, her face was bright, red, and she began croaking. At first I thought she was ill, but then I looked up and realized she was engaged in sexual relations. Grandmother Jinatsu, he said and laughed. Who was the unlucky gentleman? That disgusting dog! She was doing it with Ono? I almost vomited, said Michi. But I could have dealt with it. The worst thing was, Ono saw me peering in, and he smiled at me and nodded. Dogs don't smile, he said. Exactly, she said. That place is haunted. Well, I'll figure out where we are eventually, and we'll make it back to Numazu by morning. I'm sorry you were so frightened. The field trip seemed a great success until then. She took a few deep breaths to calm herself. Perhaps that was the true spirit of autumn, she said. The story of a ghost, he said. The silver car sped along in the moonlight. Michi was leaning against the window, her eyes closed. Riku thought he was heading for the coast. He took a tight turn on a narrow mountain road and something suddenly lunged out of the woods at the car. He felt an impact as he swerved, turning back just in time to avoid the drop beyond the lane he'd strayed into. Michi woke at the impact and said, What's happening? I think I grazed a deer back there. I've got to pull over and check to see if the car is okay. Michi leaned forward and adjusted the rearview mirror so she could look out the back window. Too late to see, he said. It was a half mile back. He eased down on the brake, slowing, and began to edge over toward the shoulder. There's something chasing us, she said. I can see it in the moonlight. Keep going. Go faster. He downshifted and took his foot off the brake. As he hit the gas, he reached up and moved the mirror out of her grasp so he could see what was following them. It's a dog, he said. 
but it's the fastest dog I ever saw. I'm doing forty-five and it's gaining on us. They passed through an area where overhanging trees blocked the moon. Watch the road, she said. When the car moved again into the moonlight, he checked behind them and saw nothing. Then they heard a loud growling. Each searched frantically to see where the noise was coming from. Swerving out of his lane, Riku looked out his side window and down and saw the creature running alongside, the movement of its four legs a blur, its face perfectly human. Kuso, he said. Open the glove compartment. There's a gun in there. Give it to me. A gun? Hurry, he yelled. She did as he instructed, handing him the sleek nine millimeter. You were right, he said. The place was haunted. He lowered his side window, switched hands between gun and wheel. Then, steadying himself, he hit the brake. The dog looked up as it sped past the car. A middle-aged woman's face, bitter, with a terrible underbite and a beauty mark beneath the left eye, riding atop the neck of a mangy gray mutt with a naked tail. As soon as it moved a foot ahead of the car, Riku thrust the gun out the window and fired. The creature suddenly exploded, turning instantly to a shower of salt. It had a face, he said, maneuvering the car out of its skid. A woman's face. Don't stop, she said. Please. Don't worry. Now, she said. Who is your employer? Why would he send you to such a place? Maybe if I tell you the truth, it'll lift whatever curse we're under. What is the truth? My employer is a very powerful businessman, and I have heard it said that he is also an onmyoji. You know him. In a moment of weakness, he told you a story about an affair he had. Afterward, he worried that you might be inclined to blackmail him. If the story got out, it would be a grave embarrassment for him both at home and at the office. He told me, spend time with her. He wanted me to judge what type of person you are. And if I'm the wrong kind of person? I'm to kill you and make it look like an accident, he said. Are you trying to scare me to death, you and the old woman? No, I swear, I'm as frightened as you are, and I couldn't harm you, believe me. I know you would never blackmail him. She rested back against the car seat and closed her eyes. She could feel his hand grasp hers. Do you believe me, he said. In the instant she opened her eyes, she saw ahead through the windshield two enormous dogs step onto the highway thirty yards in front of the car. Watch out! she screamed. He'd been looking over at her. He hit the brake before even glancing to the windshield. The car locked up and skidded, the headlights illuminating two faces, a man with a thin black mustache and wireframe glasses whose mouth was gaping open, and a little girl chubby with black bangs, tongue sticking out. On impact, the front of the car crumpled, the airbags deployed, and the horrid dogs burst into salt. The car left the road and came to a stop on the right-hand side, just before the tree line. Riku remained conscious through the accident. He undid his seatbelt and slid out of the car, brushing glass off his shirt. His forehead had struck the rearview mirror, and there was a gash on his right temple. He heard growling, and pushing himself away from the car, he headed around to Michi's side. A small, pot-bellied dog with the face of an idiot, sunken eyes and swollen lower lip, was drooling and scratching at Michi's window. Riku aimed, pulled the trigger, and turned the monstrosity to salt. He opened the passenger door. Michi was just coming around. He helped her out and leaned her against the car. Bending over, he reached into the glove compartment and found an extra clip for the gun. As he backed out of the car, he heard them coming up the road, a pack of them, speeding through the moonlight, howling and grunting. He grabbed her hand, and they made for the tree line. Not the woods, she said, and tried to free herself from his grasp. No, there's no place to hide on the road. Come on. They fled into the darkness beneath the trees. Riku literally dragging her forward. Low branches whipped their faces and tangled Michi's hair. Although ruts tripped them, they miraculously never fell. The baying of the beasts sounded only steps behind them, but when he turned and lifted the gun, he saw nothing but night.
Eventually, they broke from beneath the trees onto a dirt road. Both were heaving for breath, and neither could run another step. She'd twisted an ankle and was limping. He put one arm around her to help her along. She was trembling. So was he. What are they? she whispered. Jin Menken, he said. Impossible. They walked slowly down the road, and stepping out from beneath the canopy of leaves, the moonlight showed them, a hundred yards off, a dilapidated building with boarded windows. I can't run anymore, he said. We'll go in there and find a place to hide. She said nothing. They stood for a moment on the steps of the place, a concrete structure, some abandoned factory or warehouse, and he tried his cell phone. No reception, he said after dialing three times and listening. He flipped to a new screen with his thumb and pressed an app icon. The screen became a flashlight. He turned it forward, held it at arm's length, and motioned with his head for Michi to get close behind him. With the gun at the ready, they moved slowly through the doorless entrance. The place was freezing cold and pitch black. As far as he could tell, there were hallways laid out in a square with small rooms off it to either side. An office building in the middle of the woods, she said. Each room had the remains of a western-style door at its entrance, pieces of shattered wood hanging on by the hinges. When he shone the phone's light into the rooms, he saw a window opening boarded from within by a sheet of plywood and an otherwise empty concrete expanse. They went down one hall and turned left into another. Michi remembered she had the same app on her phone and lit it. Halfway down that corridor, they found a room whose door was mostly intact, but for a corner at the bottom where it appeared to have been kicked in. Riku inspected the knob and whispered, There's a lock on this one. They went in, and he locked the door behind them and tested its strength. Get in the corner under the window, he said. If they find us, the door won't hold. I can rip off the board above us, and we might be able to escape outside. She joined him in the corner, and they sat, shoulders touching, their backs against the cold concrete. We're sure to be safe when the sun rises. He put his arm around her, and she leaned into him. Then neither said a word, nor made a sound. They turned off their phones and listened to the dark. Time passed. Yet when Riku checked his watch, it read only 3.30. All that in a half hour? He wondered. Then there came a sound, a light tapping, as if rain was falling outside. The noise slowly grew louder, and seconds later it became clear that it was the sound of claws on the concrete floor. That light tapping eventually became a clatter, as if a hundred of the creatures were circling impatiently in the hallway. A strange Guttural voice came from the hole at the bottom corner of the door. Tomodachi, it said. Let us in. Riku flipped to the flashlight app and held the gun up. Across the room, the hole in the bottom of the door was filled with a fat, pale, bearded face. One eye was swollen shut and something oozed from the corner of it. The forehead was too high to see a hairline. The thing snuffled and smiled. Shoot, said Michi. Riku fired, but the face flinched away in an instant, and once the bullet went wide and drilled a neat hole in the door, the creature returned and said, Tomodachi. What do you want? said Riku, his voice cracking. We are hunting a spirit of the living, said the creature, the movement of its lips out of sync with the words it spoke. What have we done? said Michi. Our hunger is great, but we only require one spirit. We only take what we need. The other person will be untouched. One spirit will feed us for a week. Michi stood up and stepped away from Riku. He also got to his feet. What are you doing? She said. Shoot them. 
she quickly lit her phone and shone it on him. Instead of aiming the gun at the door, he aimed it at her. I'm not having my spirit devoured, he said to her. You said you couldn't hurt me. It won't be me hurting you, he said. She saw there were tears in his eyes. The hand that held the gun was wobbling. I'm giving you the girl, he called to the Jin Mengen. A true benefactor, said the face at the hole. No, she said. What have I done? I'm going to shoot her in the leg so she can't run. Then I'm going to let you all in. You will keep your distance from me or I'll shoot. I have an extra clip and I'll turn as many of you to salt as I can before you get to me. Turning to Michi, he said, I'm so sorry. I did love you. But you're a coward. You don't have to shoot me in the leg, she said. I'll go to them on my own. My spirit's tired of this world. She moved forward and gave him a kiss. Her actions disarmed him and he appeared confused. At the door, she slowly undid the lock on the knob. Then, with a graceful, fluid motion, she pulled the door open and stepped behind it against the wall. Take him! he heard her call. The Jinmenken bounded in, dozens of them, small and large, stinking of rain, slobbering, snapping, clawing. He pulled the trigger till the gun clicked empty and the room was filled with smoke and flying salt. His hands shook too much to change the clip. One of the creatures tore a bloody chunk from his left calf and he screamed. Another went for his groin. The face of Grandmother Chinatsu appeared before him and devoured his. The following week, in a private room at The Limit, Michi sat at a blonde wood table, staring out at the open panel across the room at the pines and the coast. Riku's employer sat across from her. Ingenious, the natural history of autumn, he said. And you knew this would draw him in? She turned to face the older man. He was a unique person, she said. He'd faced death. Too bad about Riku, he said. I wanted to trust him. Really, the lengths to which you'll go to test the spirit of those you need to trust. He's gone because he was a coward? A coward I can tolerate. But he said he loved you and it proved he didn't understand love at all. A dangerous flaw. He took an envelope from within his suit jacket and laid it on the table. A job well done, he said. She lifted the envelope and looked inside. A cold breeze blew into the room. You know, he said, this season always reminds me of our time together. As she spoke, she never stopped counting the bills. All I remember of that, she said, is the snow. Mantis Wives by Keege Johnson As for insects, their lives are sustained only by intricate processes of fantastic horror. John Wyndham Eventually, the Mantis women discovered that killing their husbands was not inseparable from the getting of young. Before this, a wife devoured her lover piece by piece during the act of coition, the head and its shining eyes going dim as she ate, the long green prothorax, the forelegs crisp as straws, the bitter wings. She left for last the metathorax and its pumping legs, the abdomen, and, finally, the phallus. Mantis women needed nutrients for their pregnancies. Their lovers offered this as well as their seed. It was believed that mantis men would resist their deaths if permitted to choose the manner of their mating, but the women learned to turn elsewhere for nutrients after draining their husbands' members, and yet the men lingered and so their ladies continued to kill them, but slowly, in the fashioning of difficult arts. What else could there be between them? The Bitter Edge 
A wife may cut through her husband's exoskeletal plates, each layer a different pattern, so that to look at a man is to see shining, hard brocade. At the deepest level are visible pieces of his core, the hint of internal parts bleeding out. He may suggest shapes. The eccentric curve of his thoughts. A wife may drill the tiniest hole into her lover's head and insert a fine hair. She presses carefully, striving for specific results, a seizure, a novel pheromone burst, a dance that ends in self-castration. If she replaces the hair with a wasp's narrow, syringing stinger, she may blow air bubbles into his head and then he will react unpredictably. There is otherwise little he may do that will surprise her or himself. What is the art of the men that they remain to die at the hands of their wives? What is the art of the wives that they kill? The Strength of Weight Removing his wings, she leads him into the path of ants. Unready Jewels a mantis wife may walk with her husband across the trunks of pines until they come to a trail of sap and ascend to an insect-clustered wound. Staying to the side, she presses him down until his legs stick fast. He may grow restless as the sap sheathes his body and wings. His eyes may not dim for some time. Smaller insects may cluster upon his honeyed body like ornaments. A mantis woman does not know why the men crave death, but she does not ask. Does she fear resistance? Does she hope for it? She has forgotten the ancient reasons for her acts, but in any case, her art is more important. The Oubliette Or a wife may take not his life, but his senses, plucking the antennae from his forehead, scouring with dust his clustered shining eyes, cracking apart his mandibles to scrape out the lining of his mouth and throat, plucking his sensing hairs from his foremost legs, excising the auditory thoracic organ, biting free the wings. A mantis woman is not cruel. She gives her husband what he seeks. Who knows what poems he fashions in the darkness of a senseless life? The scent of violets. They mate many times until one dies. Two stones grind together. A wife collects with her forelegs small brightly colored poisonous insects, places them upon bitter green leaves, and encourages her husband to eat them. He is sometimes reluctant after the first taste, but she speaks to him, or else he calms himself and eats. He may foam at the mouth and anus, or grow paralyzed and fall from a branch. In extreme cases, he may stagger along the ground until he is seen by a bird and swallowed, and then even the bird may die. Amantus has no veins. What passes for blood flows freely within its protective shell. It does have a heart. The Desolate Junkland or a mantis wife may lay her husband gently upon a soft bed and bring to him cool drinks and silver dishes filled with sweetmeats. She may offer him crossword puzzles and pornography, may kneel at his feet and tell him stories of mantis men who are heroes, may dance in veils before him. He tears off his own legs before she begins. It is unclear whether the desolate junk land is her art or his. Shame's uniformity. A wife may return to the first art and, in a variant, devour her husband, but from the abdomen forward. Of all the arts, this is hardest. There is no hair, no ant's bite, no sap, no intervening instrument. He asks her questions until the end. He may doubt her motives. Or she may. The paper folder lichens dance, the ambition of aphids, civil wars, the secret history of cumulus, the lost eyes found, sedges, the unbeaked sparrow, 
there are as many arts as there are husbands and wives. The Cruel Web Perhaps they wish to love each other, but they cannot see a way to exist that does not involve the barb, the sticking sap, the bitter taste of poison. The cruel web can be performed only in the brambles of woods, and only when there has been no recent rain and the spider's webs have grown thick. Wife and husband walk together. Webs catch and cling to their carapaces, their legs, their half-opened wings. They tear free, but the webs collect. Their glowing eyes grow veiled. Their curious antennae come to a tangled halt. Their pheromones become confused. Their legs struggle against the gathering web. The spiders wait. She is larger and stronger than he, but they often fall together. How to live. A mantis may dream of something else. This also may be a trap. Tender as Teeth by Stephanie Crawford and Duane Swersinski Is it true that the cure made all of you vegetarians? Carson asked. Justine was staring at the road ahead, but could see him toying with his digital recorder in her peripheral vision. He was asking a flurry of questions, but at the same time avoiding the big question. She wished he'd just come out with it already. Why are you asking me? She replied. I'm not the mouthpiece for every single survivor. Carson stammered a little before Justine glanced over and gave him a wide grin. Oh, yes, I refer to former zombies as survivors. Make sure to include that. Your readers will love it. As they drove across the desert, the sun was pulling the sky from black to a gritty blue-gray. The rented compact car held a 33-year-old man named Carson with enough expensive camera equipment to crowd up the back seat, and Justine, a woman two years younger, who kept her own small shoulder bag between her feet. The rest of her baggage was invisible. Some said as far as apocalyptic plagues went... It could have been a lot worse. The dead didn't crawl out of their graves. Society didn't crumble entirely. The infection didn't spread as easily as it did in the movies. You had to either really try to get infected or be genetically predisposed to it. Justine happened to be one of the latter. After work one night, Justine was nursing a Pabst at her local generic suburban sports bar while half listening to the news about a virus that would probably quiet down like H1N1 and texting her late friend Gina. She was just raising the bottle's mouth to her lips when a thick, dead weight fell against her and knocked her out of her bar stool and onto the sticky peanut shell covered floor. Too fucking enraged to wait for a good Samaritan to jump up and give a Hey, pal! Justine started blindly kicking out her heels and thrusting out fists at the drunk bastard. That's how it played out until the drunk started gnawing at her fists until his incisors connected with the actual bone of her fingers, while his mouth worked to slurp up and swallow the shredded meat of her knuckles. After that, Justine remembered little until the cure hit her bloodstream. That had been six months after the attack in the bar. And in the meantime... Carson tried to look at Justine without full-on staring at her. Like much of the time he'd spent with her so far, he was fairly certain he was failing miserably. The miracle vaccine seemed to have left Justine with little more damage than a scarred face a lean, muscled body that bordered on emaciation, and an entire planet filled with people who actively wanted her dead. That was called being one of the lucky ones. Keep her talking, he reminded himself. Carson asked, I understand your mom paid for the cure. Justine kicked the glove compartment while crossing her legs. Sadly, yes. I guess she meant well. Aren't you glad to be alive? if you call this living. Better than being dead? She turned to face him, squinting and twisting her lips into a pout. Is it? 
Asking questions was the problem, Carson decided. He wasn't a real journalist. He'd only brought the digital recorder to please his editor, who couldn't afford to send both a photographer and a reporter. Just keep her talking as much as possible, the editor had said. We'll make sense of it later. But most important, his editor added, we want her to talk about what it's like. What what is like? Carson had asked. His editor replied, what it's like to go on living. A year ago today, he'd been out in Las Vegas for one of the most inane reasons of all, a photo shoot for a celebrity cookbook. The celebrity in question was a borderline, morbidly obese actor known for both his comedic roles as well as his darker turns in mob flicks. Right before he'd left on that trip, the first outbreaks had been reported, but the virus seemed to be contained to certain parts of the country, and Carson thought he'd come to regret it if he turned down the assignment over the latest health scare, especially if that would leave him stuck in his Brooklyn apartment for months on end while this thing ran its course. They were saying it could be as bad as the 1918 flu pandemic. Oh, if he had only known. The outbreak had happened mid-shoot. A pack of zombies had burst in just as the food stylist had finished with the chicken scarpariello. They weren't interested in the dish. They wanted the celebrity chef instead. Carson kept snapping photos before he quite realized what was happening. He escaped across Vegas, continuing to take photos as the city tore itself apart. And then he saw Justine, though he didn't know her name then. Back then, she was just... Carson heard his editor's impatient reminder in his head. Keep her talking. Yeah. Not talking was the reason he'd become a photographer. He preferred to keep the lens between himself and the rest of the world, speaking to subjects only when he absolutely had to. He was struggling to formulate a new inane question when she spoke up. Do you remember the exact place? Carson nodded. So where was it? Justine asked. That surprised him. He assumed she would have just known. Maybe not when she was in that state, because the former zombies, the survivors, were supposed to have blanked memories. The photo, though. Surely she had to have seen the photo at some point. Or did she? Outside of Vegas, almost near Henderson. Huh, Justine said. Makes sense. Does it? That's not far from where I used to live. So come on, where did you, um, encounter me? Carson pulled onto the five, which would take them out of the valley and out through the desert. I'm hoping I'll be able to find it again once we're out there, he said. Don't count on it, buddy boy, she said. My mom tells me they've raised a lot of the old neighborhood. There's even been talk of abandoning Vegas altogether. Clear everyone out, then drop an H-bomb directly on it. Wipe the slate clean. Carson, still fumbling, heard the question tumble out of his mouth before he could stop himself. Have you, um, seen the photo? Justine had woken up in the hospital, still spoiling for a fight. After about a minute, her eyes registered that she was in a hospital bed, and she felt her mom squeezing her hand through layers of aching pain and a wooziness that could only be coming from the IV attached to her arm, so she'd assumed. So the bastard actually put her in the hospital? Justine's first lucid words were spent reassuring her mom— who herself looked like she'd been put through the ringer. Hey, Ma, it's all right. You should see the other guy. That's what she attempted to say, at any rate. It came out sounding more like, Ach, am I shut ass, other guy. Her voice sounded cracked and enfeebled, almost as if her actual esophagus was bruised and coated in grime. Her mother teared up and went in for the most delicate hug Justine could remember ever having experienced. 
Thank God he finally showed up. Thank God you're back, and thank him that you don't remember. It was only then that Justine noticed that the doctors and nurses surrounding her had what could only be taken as unprofessional looks of pure, barely disguised looks of disgust on their faces. All this for a fucking bar fight she didn't even start? Before Justine could ask what exactly was going on, her mom cupped her palm against her daughter's cheek. Justine couldn't help realizing how hollowed out it felt against her mom's warm hand. Sweetie, I have a lot I need to tell you. It's not when you think it is, and you're not exactly who you think you are anymore. The world got infected and wormed you worse than anyone. You're going to need to prepare yourself. Just know I love you, always. And then her mom told her what the world had been up to. Justine stared at the passing power lines with an interest they didn't exactly warrant. Is this professional curiosity? No, Carson said. I'd really like to know. Justine glanced over at Carson, who gave her a tight-lipped smile. She had done her research on him, and she was almost personally insulted by what she found. A small part of her was hoping she'd get a gonzo journalist type that would end the interview with him trying to hunt her in a most dangerous game scenario. Carson was, at best, a mid-level photog, his writing credits adding up to captions under his glossy photos of celebrities she had never heard of. There were a few dashes of pretension, but he was clearly paying the bills. Except for those unexpected, dramatic moments every photographer lives for, he had a few absorbing shots. The main one starring her own self. My mom kept it from me for as long as possible. She acted a bit as if seeing it would trigger me somehow. But, eh. Justine started absently gnawing on a fingernail with more vigor than she realized. I'll see the little thumbnails on Google and squint my eyes to blur it out. I've been told about it enough that my taste to see the actual money shot has long been sated. Justine glanced over at Carson to see how that landed. She was sleep-deprived and barely knew the guy, but he somehow looked puzzled. Was she serious? How could she have not looked? Carson knew he'd created that photo by pure accident. Even the framing and lighting and composition were a happy accident, a trifecta of the perfect conditions, snapped at exactly the right moment. He admitted it. He'd lucked into it. He couldn't even claim to have created that photo. He'd merely been the one holding the camera, his index finger twitching. That image wanted to exist. He was simply the conduit. The photo wasn't his fault. Just like her sickness wasn't her fault. They were like two car accident victims, thrown together by chance and left to deal with the wreckage. He got all that. Still, how could she not want to see? How could you ever hope to recover if you didn't confront it head on? Pull over, she said suddenly. Are you okay? Unless you want to clean chunks of puke out of this rental, pull over now, please. Carson was temporarily desert blind. He couldn't tell where the edge of the broken road ended and the dead, dry earth began. Blinking, he slowly edged to the right as Justine's hands fumbled at the door handle. He saw, felt, her entire body jolt. He applied the brake, kicking up a huge plume of dust. Justine flew out of the passenger seat even before the car had come to a complete halt. She disappeared into the dust. Within seconds, Carson could hear her heaving. He knew this was what the cure did to you. It took away the zombie, but left you a very, very sick person. Should he get out? Did she maybe want a little water or her privacy? He didn't know. For a moment, Carson sat behind the wheel watching the dust settle back down. There were a lot of dust storms out here, he'd read. The Southwest hadn't seen them this bad since the 30s Dust Bowl days. Some people thought it was nature's way of trying to wipe the slate clean, one sharp grain of sand at a time. 
all was quiet. She'd stopped heaving. Justine? He called out. You okay? He opened the door just as the truck pulled up behind them. Damn it. Probably a good Samaritan thinking they needed help. Justine? Car doors slammed behind Carson. He turned off the ignition, pulled the keys from the steering column, pushed open the door with his foot, stepped out into the hot, dry air. There were three people standing there. Carson was struck at first by how familiar they looked, but couldn't immediately place them. Not until one of them said, Where's the baby killer? Fuck me, he thought. It was the protesters. They'd followed them out into the desert. When Carson arrived at Justine's Burbank apartments just a few hours earlier, he was stunned to see them there, carrying placards and pacing up and down the front walkway. They must have been at it all night, and towards the end of some kind of shift, because they looked tired, haggard, and vacant-eyed. Ironically enough, they kind of looked like you-know-whats. Carson was equally stunned by the things coming out of their mouths, the sheer hate painted on their signs. An abomination lives here. That baby had a future. Kill yourself, Justine. Delusional people who had to seize on something, he supposed. There was a whole disbelief in the cure movement going on now, with a groundswell of people who brought out these pseudo-scientists claiming that the cure was only temporary, that at any moment thousands of people could revert to flesh-eating monsters again. There was not a lick of scientific evidence to back this up, mind you. But when has that stopped zealots before? Carson had parked the car a block away in the rubble of a lot in front of an old 50-style motel that had promptly gone out of business a year ago during the chaos. He wiped the sweat from his brow. Wasn't California supposed to be cooler this time of year? At first, he grabbed his small digital camera and locked everything else in the trunk, figuring that if he tried to run that gauntlet with his full gear, there was a strong chance he'd be molested. Carson was prepared for anything, but wasn't in the mood to lose ten grand worth of gear that he knew the paper wouldn't replace. But then again, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Wasn't that what Hunter S. Thompson said? Carson donned his vest. He hated it, but people associated it with being a pro, so... And walked right up to the nutcases, smiling. That's right, he thought. Just a happy photojournalist on assignment, here to take your picture. That's the thing. You don't ask. You keep your camera low and just start shooting. Ask, and there's a strong chance they'll think, Hey, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't agree to this. But if you act like God himself sent you down here to record the moments for posterity, most people will step out of your way and let you do his holy work. Carson snapped away from waist level. Sometimes you want that feeling of looking up from a child's POV, right up into the faces of these lunatics, the sun bouncing from their hand-painted signs. Carson was feeling good about the assignment when something hard slammed into the center of his back and he tumbled forward into someone's fist. These things happen so fast. Your ass getting kicked. In the movies, there's always an explanation. Your antagonists go to great pains to tell you exactly why you're going to receive a brutal beating right before the beating actually happens. Not in reality. When a mob attacks you, and blood's filling your mouth, and someone's kicking you in the back, and you can feel your internal organs convulsing. There are no explanations. But Carson heard one thing, the most chilling thing he could possibly hear, actually. And that was his name. They know who I am, he thought. They know I'm the one who had made Zombie Chick famous. Which was when said Zombie Chick saved Carson from hospitalization. She didn't rush down and start growling at the crowd, asking for brains. She merely opened her window and stared down at them. Carson didn't notice it at first. All he sensed was that the kicks came slower and then tapered off entirely. The crowd backed away from Carson and focused on her, up in her window. 
cursing at her, gesturing at her, spitting, picking up tiny chunks of broken sidewalk and hurling them at her. Only then did she duck inside and slide the window shut. Carson wanted to get the hell out of there, pronto. But then he imagined stepping into his boss's office empty-handed, without a single photo. That simply wasn't an option. Not if he wanted to eat. So he pushed himself, ribs and legs screaming, and took advantage of the temporary distraction, jogging right up through the center of the crowd, pushing his way past them, blasting through the front door of the apartment complex. By the time they noticed, it was too late. Carson had flipped the deadbolt behind him. As he scanned the mailboxes with the call buzzers, he could hear them yelling, threatening to kill him for real. Looked like they wanted to make good on that promise now, out here in an empty stretch of desert with no one to interrupt them. Justine looked down at what she evacuated, noting it was pretty much pure water. She started to straighten up but stopped herself when she noticed the long shadows stumble over themselves. Shit. Justine stayed bent over, hands on her knees, mind racing. She could hear muffled angry voices and some half-hearted pounding on a car. She figured it was road warriors, insanely persistent Latter-day Saints missionaries, or they were being followed by her own personal raincoat brigade. Whoever it was, she was going to need a decent-sized rock at the very least, and she needed to look as fucked up as possible. The latter was covered, and her eyes scanned quickly for the former. Jackpot. Eyes up. Take it slow. Most of the brigade, biggest bunch of vultures this desert has ever produced, Justine thought, was standing back from the car attempting to look casual but barely pulling off vaguely gassy. There were three men in their mid-forties actually on the car. One was playing the lean-against-the-windshield cop move while the other two were settling for leaning against the side. Justine crouched in the warm dirt, obscured by a large grouping of banana yucca. If Carson had left the passenger seat unlocked, she could probably jump in, he could floor it, and ride like hell until they got to a gas station. Fake cop had just cocked some kind of gun. Seriously? Fuck this. Fuck all of it. She should have never agreed to this interview. She was probably going to be one of those survivors who ended up dead, for real, this time, at the hands of a frightened mob. Unless she could use their fear against them. Justine stood up, stretched, and moaned. Moaned like some kind of unholy, undead piece of hell would yawn after centuries of hungry slumber. Or whatever these assholes believed. There she is! Why didn't anyone see her get out? Weren't you supposed to be watching that patch, Dana? There's the baby killer. I bet they don't prosecute in Nevada and he's smuggling her. But the crowd quickly lost interest in Carson and his compact car and moved en masse towards Justine. Just a yard down was a van with a flat tire facing the road. Clever, dumb bastards, Justine thought. That'll keep the passing cars moving. I'd ask if you didn't have anything better to do, Justine called out, but after watching you all for months out my window, I know you don't. Justine found bravado sometimes worked when the rocks weren't up to snuff. One of the guys leaning against the car gave a grimace that bordered on a grin at Justine. You have served no jail time for killing the most innocent of our Savior's creations. We just want to talk to you about it. Maybe get you to turn yourself in. There's no reason for you to get your bowels in an uproar. Some of the gang nodded in agreement. Others just eyed Justine as if she was about to leap out like a cat in a closet in a bad slasher movie. Fake cop kept his fingers moving on the gun that he was holding close to his thigh. Justine glanced over to the car. Carson was standing there quietly. Now that their little freak was front and center, nobody bothered to keep an eye on him. He had his cell phone in his hand. He made eye contact and gave a short nod. Please, Justine thought, don't come to my rescue, photo boy. From the looks of you, you've got the muscle strength of warm butter. 
Moving her eyes back to the group, Justine took a deep breath and tried to make eye contact with as many as possible. Look, I really understand. I hate myself too, Justine said, but I really, truly was not myself when that happened, and believe me, they would have found out if I was. I'm cured now, and my life is a living hell, so can you just leave me alone to fester it out, please? You guys will just go to jail, and I'm really not worth it. Maybe we can just shoot her here, one of them said. Another said, Shut up! Just shut up! You weren't even invited here, you dumb psycho! Fake cop and the one that had been talking had a tension between them that made Justine more nervous than the pure hatred that was being leveled at her. The man turned back to her. I'm sorry, this was stupid. My name is Mike. How about you let your friend leave? And you come with us, and we can talk to my brother. He's a police officer, and we can get you right. Mike stopped himself. Justine could see that he had just spotted the phone in Carson's hand. Well, shit, son, Mike said. I really wish you hadn't done that. Justine, strangely enough, wished the same thing. For an awful moment there, Carson thought that Justine's cure hadn't fully taken. His fevered imagination put together the sequence of events this way. She's riding along, in the sun, next to a living human being. She doesn't get out much. She's not around people much. Something in her breaks down. She senses the flesh, the blood beating through his veins. It's all too much. It makes her sick. She thinks she has to puke. She asks him to pull over, and she scrambles from the car when it hits her. She can't help it. Can't control it. Suddenly, she's acting like a zombie again. Because suddenly, she was. A zombie again. Forcing this unholy sound out of her throat, clawing at invisible enemies, eyes rolling up in the back of her head. The protest mob jolted, taking a step away from each other as if collectively hoping the crazy baby-killing zombie bitch would attack the person standing next to them. Carson jolted too from the shock of it, but also the thought that just a few minutes ago he'd been inside a speeding car with this woman. Thing. He instantly regretted that it was a cell phone in his hand and not his camera, which was still packed up in the back seat. He hated himself for even thinking it, but come on. The impact of a photo like that would be seismic, proof that the cure doesn't work, as shown by its most infamous poster child. But those fantasies were dashed the moment he heard Justine scream in perfect English, Carson, the car, now! The best Justine could hope for was not getting shot. She dove into the crowd and just started shoving. There was no telling how many other guns were hiding in this group, but she was counting on the stark raving fear factor and element of surprise to keep the men from using them, for a few seconds at least, until fucking Carson got the car revved up. Carson? God damn it! She couldn't keep herself from picturing how, if Carson wasn't here, she'd probably just have gone for it. Her anger and annoyance were burning so hot that she could easier have chosen this day as her last as long as she took these assholes out along with her. Baby-eating zombie desert rampage. Eight dead. Justine smiled at the imagined headline. She should have been the journalist. But no, Justine felt oddly protective towards Carson. He wasn't much, but right at this moment he was the only one listening. One last blind elbow to what felt like a butt, and Justine scrammed it to the passenger door. Go, go, go! She screamed at Carson as she locked her door, screaming in laughter as Carson fishtailed it out of there with white knuckles. All we need is some banjo chase music, compadre! Once they'd cleared the first quarter mile, Justine patted the shoulder of the poor, shaking Carson. The fuck? Carson sputtered. The fuck was that? The usual, Justine said. Are you okay? I mean, shit, did they... Justine looked behind them, seeing only a random semi-truck. I'm fine. Actually, no, I'm not fine. I'm hungry. Starving, even. 
Carson looked at her, wide-eyed. Justine noticed the stare also contained a bit of apprehension. What? And in answer to your earlier question, she said, no, I'm not a vegetarian. Justine had Carson stop at a roadside barbecue joint a handful of miles outside Barstow. She assured him it was the best obscure outdoor barbecue you could get in the Southwest, not to mention that she was pretty sure the owner was a hell's angel and therefore coated the area with a kind of grimy aura of protection. Carson sat at a picnic table while Justine ordered them two orders of the works. She had put on a pair of large framed glasses and affected an uneven Texan drawl, claiming it was a disguise while Carson suspected it was mostly to amuse herself. Roughly half an hour had passed since they were accosted, but in that short span of time Justine had seemed to come alive. Bouncing in her seat, looking behind them in her sun visor's mirror and squeezing his shoulder every few minutes, she was as enthusiastic as he imagined she might have been on a regular road trip in her life before the infection had made her somber and shifty-eyed. Her skin also seemed to take on what he could only describe as a glow, and her stone-gray eyes seemed to skew closer to silver. How much for one rib? Carson sat up straight and turned to see Justine laughing with the barbecue proprietor before shaking her head and walking to their table. She smiled at him before laying down a stack of white sandwich bread and two styrofoam boxes in front of him. Is everything okay? Did you need more money? Carson asked while he peeked under one of the lids. What? Are you not familiar with the comedic stylings of Chris Rock? Justine was still putting on her weird drawl, which was towing the line between cute and unsettling pretty aggressively. I'm gonna get you, sucker? No? Boy, we need to hook you up with a movie marathon. Justine took the bench across from Carson, popped open her lid, and proceeded to stare at the meat. The only motion she made was to follow in the tradition of countless customers before her in leisurely picking at the peeling red paint of the table with a fingernail. Carson couldn't help indulging himself in a mouthful of brisket before asking her if everything was okay. Justine sighed. No, sure. Everything is fine. This is the first time I've even had the desire to eat meat since you-know-what, let alone actually ate the stuff. Before that, I was a stone-cold carnivore. She never took her eyes off her meal, but had worked up to poking it around with her spork. Carson raised his eyebrows and took a long sip of his lukewarm Mountain Dew. He became aware of a weird undercurrent that had seemed to sit itself at their table, but couldn't place it. Justine stabbed at a piece of pork until the weak teeth of the spork finally speared it enough to lift. He eyed the meat and her mouth, wishing he had his camera out. She caught him staring. He flashed her a quick, reassuring half-smile when their eyes met. Justine saluted him with her spork full of pork and took it in one bite. She chewed. Carson took another mouthful of his meal in camaraderie. He waited until they both swallowed and took sips of their respective drinks before asking her how it was. Tastes good, but just that one bite already made my jaw ache. Does eating hurt? Aren't you forward? But no, the little I eat just sits with me funny and makes my tongue feel coated in something like wax. I probably brush my teeth about ten times a day. I don't care enough about my checkups with the therapist or doctor to find out if it's mostly in my head or if human veal just forever fucked up my stomach. Carson coughed in surprise, choking a bit as Justine's words hit him. She gave him a sad shrug and continued eating the meat. This is good, though. No coated tongue feeling, either. Maybe you just needed time. Just try to take it slow. Carson took out his camera, nodded as if to ask, Is this okay? Justine paused for a moment before nodding in return. He snapped a few photos of her eating with the large, faded Moose's barbecue sign behind her. Suddenly, he noticed a man moving at a leaden pace a few feet behind Justine. Carson lowered his camera. 
The man was gaunt, with gnarled hands reminiscent of arthritic joints and old tree branches. He worked his mouth around, hungrily, almost like an infant eyeing a nipple just out of reach. Only when he noticed the old, slow shambling man pull out a black and mild cigar and chomp it between his grinning teeth did he relax. I'll be right back, Justine said, and put a hand on his shoulder as she passed. Carson thought she might be feeling sick again. But when he glanced across the way a few minutes later, he saw that she was on her cell phone. They rode in mostly companionable silence for about ninety more minutes until the suburban sprawl of Henderson appeared. Carson felt a thrumming work its way up his spine, plucking at his nerves until his skin physically itched. Here was the moment he'd been dreading, setting up a shot where you ask someone to hunker down in a place where they'd experienced the darkest moment of their life. You, uh, feeling okay? Carson asked. Justine rustled a bit in her seat, looking tiny and weird from the corner of Carson's eye. Yeah, was worried about all that food I ate, but it's staying down. Carson cleared his throat, and Justine hurried over the sound. I know that's not what you're asking about, but I'm putting off any reaction to this as long as I can. Is that okay with you? Carson nodded as he squeezed his hands tighter around the wheel. Justine crammed some more gum into her mouth. She had told him that, with her stomach working with rarely any food in it, had given her death breath. He hadn't noticed any of it personally, but when she also divulged how often and obsessively she brushed her teeth, he understood that the situation went a little deeper than oral hygiene. Carson fumbled at the radio dials until he heard Sam Cook's voice. He told himself to stop feeling guilty. Everyone in this car was there by choice, right? Of course they were. Except they really weren't. Carson had been there by chance. Justine had been there because of a fluke of a disease. She didn't know what she was doing, where she'd gone, who she'd hurt. And it was only because Carson happened to be there with his camera that Justine and the rest of the world knew that while she'd been a zombie... She had eaten an infant child. The area had been cleaned up more than Carson expected. Imported palm trees stood perfectly distanced from each other, as pretty and welcoming as well-trained showgirls. As they pulled into the parking lot of the grocery store, his memory replaced the newly built structures with the way he remembered the place looking the last time he was here a looted-out, broken shell of a place crawling with cops, zombies, and reporters like himself. There was a rumor that the area was harboring a building full of people who had taken over a grocery store after raiding a gun store, but the virus had gotten in there with them. Carson had been unable to confirm any of this at the time. He was mostly walking around in the area in a horrified daze, snapping photos to give himself a sense of purpose in all the chaos. So, where were you? Justine asked. Carson shook himself mentally into the present. I was walking around the barricades at the back of the lot. I guess luckily nobody was paying much attention to me. My editor just told me to snap anything interesting or fucked up that might pop out. Justine turned to him. And then out I popped. All interesting and fucked up with bells on? Carson tried to smile. Yeah. Justine laughed in surprise, but it quickly died in her throat. They slowly pulled themselves out of the car, groaning and stretching as they squinted into the sun. A nervous and false jovial energy permeated the air between them, as if they decided by an unspoken vote to act as if they were here to recreate a photo from a first date rather than an amnesiac murder. Justine wandered the half-full parking lot while Carson started gathering and preparing his gear. Once he was fully kitted up, he inhaled deeply and started towards her. Keeping her back to him, she said, I thought maybe standing here there'd be something, a fragment of memory. But no. In all honesty, it's almost hard to remember it happening myself. It happened so quickly and there was so much chaos. Did anyone try to stop me? 
Did you? Carson stopped fidgeting before answering. Stop? I mean, the cops tackled you. The thing is, I think the baby was already dead. I didn't hear crying. How did I get it? Uh... Carson wished for a cigarette more than he had wished for anything else in the entirety of his life. There was a huge crush of people running out of the shopping center when the police smoked them out. They think the baby was inside and got trampled. There was a broken stroller nearby. It was, in fact, in the photograph. He heard Justine exhale shakily. Fuck me. Fuck you and fuck this. What's the point of us being here? I'd want me dead too. Let's just get this done so I can crawl back to my hole. Carson silently worked his mouth open and closed, platitudes at the ready on his tongue. They didn't want to come out, though. Every fiber of his being fully agreed with her that being here was wrong. In for a penny, in for a pound, though. The texts he had been getting from his editor were becoming increasingly insistent. Yeah, all right. The photojournalist considered the parking lot around them, trying to avoid looking at the photo again on his iPhone and going solely by memory. The pile of rubble. I'm pretty sure it was over there. He pointed at a grouping of empty parking spaces, completely indistinguishable from any other in the world. Apparently, not everything required a plaque. They made their way over, the cloud of unease silencing them. Everything was so generic and bright around them that it gave the entire assignment the feel of some kind of ill-planned play-acting. The only piece of reality that didn't seem like a part of their make-believe was a small murder of crows nearby that were effectively edging any pigeons out of their territory. It seemed easier to just mumble and gesture the whole thing. In the back of his mind, Carson supposed he had hoped returning here might summon up at least an emotional memory for Justine. But it was clear that whatever breakthrough he had been hoping for was doomed to die the quiet death of simply going through the motions. Carson pointed and shot, getting the majority of his pictures framing Justine in front of the rapidly setting sun. She crouched, stood, and even sat in a few, looking pensive and disconnected in each one. The stark contrast of a traumatized woman in a new parking lot made the whole thing feel a dust-in-the-blood kind of dirty to Carson. The look in her eyes, though. All right, I think we got it. We can go. She didn't move. What's wrong? Carson asked. Aren't you going to ask me? Ask you what? All this time together, and you're too timid to ask the question. I know you want to ask. It's been all over your face since we met. Carson opened his mouth, then closed it and shook his head. Go ahead, Justine said, hands on her hips. Ask me, how can I possibly go on living after something like that? How can I make jokes and drop stupid pop culture references and eat ribs and laugh and listen to music? Isn't that what you want to know? Isn't that what you've been dying to ask me this whole time? Carson didn't know how to respond, mainly because she was dead right. It was the question he'd wanted to ask ever since he'd heard the news a month ago that the famous baby eater, the subject of a photo that had won him fame he didn't want and a claim he didn't deserve, was still alive. How do you go on living after something like that? Justine sighed and walked past him, muttering, Let's get to a hotel with a bar. Thanks for being less of a dick about this than I thought you'd be, she said. They were sitting at the bar in some sports-themed joint on the ground floor of a chain hotel on the edge of Henderson, knees almost touching. Carson stared into his beer, already thinking about the new set of photos he'd just made, wondering if it was going to do more harm than good. Of course, he'd sold it to Justine as a way to show the world that she wasn't a monster, that the cure did work. But now he wasn't so sure. Justine laid her hand over his and gave a gentle squeeze. Her other hand fiddled with her cell phone on the bar top. Hey. Carson met her gaze. Said nothing. 
What could he say? That he was about to ruin her life all over again? The photo of Justine eating ribs alone. Ugh. She had no idea what she'd agreed to. Look, I'm serious, Justine said. You've been good to me despite everything, which is why I feel bad about doing this. Doing what? Without warning, she leaned forward and pressed her lips to his. To a passerby, it would have looked like a couple doing a parody of a cover of a historical romance novel, except with the man in the submissive stance. Right in the thick of it, however, was a demented sincerity. Justine used her tongue to pry open his lips. What the hell was she doing? Justine didn't have death breath. He could taste peppermint and beer. Her lips were warm. But still, all he could think about was where her lips had been, and about the chunks of flesh her tongue had once licked away from her teeth. Before he could break the embrace, he heard the sound of a fake camera shutter snapping closed. Oh, God, Carson thought as his eye popped open and saw the cell in her hand. She's taken a photo of her own. Wait, he said, please. But Justine's fingers were already working the keypad, and the photo was already on its way to a wireless cell tower, and from there, who knew? She glanced up at him. Sorry, I grabbed your boss's number when you left your cell phone at the barbecue place. He's just one, though. I guess I could have sold this as an exclusive, but that felt a little tacky. Carson pulled back from the table and just stared. His eyes felt feverish as they flitted from Justine's face to the phone, to the staring bar patrons surrounding them. You want to know what it was like? To have your worst moment broadcast to the world? Justine asked. Buddy, you're about to find out. She smiled and reached back to hold his shaking hand. But at least we have each other, right? The Callers by Ramsey Campbell Mark's grandmother seems barely to have left the house when his grandfather says, Can you entertain yourself for a bit? I could do with going to the pub while I've got the chance. Mark wonders how much they think they've entertained him, but he only says, Will Grandma be all right coming home on her own? Never fret, son. They can look after themselves. The old man's hairy caterpillar eyebrows squirm as he frowns at Mark and blinks his bleary eyes clear. No call for you to fetch her. It's women's stuff, the bingo. He gives the boy's shoulder an unsteady squeeze and mutters, You're a good sort to have around. Mark feels awkward and a little guilty that he's glad he doesn't have to meet his grandmother. Maybe I'll go to a film. You'd better have a key, then. His grandfather rummages among the contents of a drawer of the shaky sideboard, documents in ragged envelopes, rubber bands so desiccated they snap when he takes hold of them, a balding reel of cotton, a crumpled folder stuffed with photographs, and hauls out a key on a frayed noose of string. Keep hold of that for the next time you come, he says. Does he mean Mark will be visiting by himself in future? Was last night's argument so serious? His mother objected when his grandfather offered him a glass of wine at dinner, and then her mother accused her of not letting Mark grow up. Before long, the women were shouting at each other about how Mark's grandmother had brought up her daughter, and the men only aggravated the conflict by trying to calm it down. It continued after Mark went to bed, and this morning his father informed him that he and Mark's mother were going home several days early. You can stay if you like, she told Mark. Was she testing his loyalty or hoping he would make up for her behavior? While her face kept her thoughts to itself, his father handed him the ticket for the train home like a business card, one man to another. Mark's mother spent some time enlisting ways he shouldn't let anyone down, but these didn't include going to the cinema. Wearing his coat was among the requirements, and so he takes it from the stand in the hall. Step out, lad, his grandfather says as Mark lingers on the pavement directly outside the front door. You don't want an old croc slowing you down. 
At the corner of the street, Mark glances back. The old man is limping after him. Resting a hand on the roof of each car parked with two wheels on the pavement, another narrow, similarly terraced street leads into the center of the small Lancashire town, where lamps on scalloped iron poles are stuttering alight beneath a congested late April sky. Many of the shops are shuttered, and some are boarded up. Just a few couples stroll past deserted pristine kitchens and uninhabited items of attire. Most of the local amusements have grown too childish for Mark, though he might still enjoy bowling or a game of indoor golf if he weren't by himself, and others are years out of bounds. The pubs, the clubs waiting for the night crowds while doormen loiter outside like wrestlers dressed for someone's funeral. Surely the cinema won't be so particular about its customers. More than one of Mark's schoolmates has shown him the scene from Face Cream on their phones, where the girl gets cream squirted all over her face. As he hurries past the clubs, he thinks a doorman is shouting behind him, but the large voice is down a side street full of shops that are nailed shut. At first he fancies that it's chanting inside one of them, and then he sees an old theater at the far end. While he can't distinguish the words, the rhythm makes it clear he's hearing a bingo caller. Mark could imagine that all the blank-faced doormen are determined to ignore the voice. The frugoplex is beyond the clubs, across a car park for at least ten times as many vehicles as it presently contains. The lobby is scattered with popcorn, handfuls of which have been trodden into the purple carpet. A puce rope on metal stilts leads the queue for tickets back and forth and twice again on the way to the counter. When Mark starts to duck under the rope closest to the end of the queue, a man behind the counter scowls at him, and so he follows the rope all the way around, only just heading off two couples of about his own age who stoop under. He's hoping to avoid the disgruntled man, but the queue brings Mark to him. Face cream, please, Mark says and holds out a ten-pound note. Don't try it on with me, laddie the man says and turns his glare to the teenagers who have trailed Mark to the counter. And your friends needn't either. He's not our friend, one of the boys protests. I reckon not when he's got you barred. Mark's face has grown hot, but he can't just walk away or ask to see a film he's allowed to watch. I don't know about them, but I'm fifteen. And I'm your sweet old granny. That's it now for the lot of you. Don't bother coming to my cinema. The manager tells his staff at the counter, Have a good look at this lot so you'll know them. Mark stumbles almost blindly out of the multiplex. He's starting across the car park when somebody mutters behind him. He wants his head kicked in. They're only words, but they express his feelings. That's what he deserves, Mark agrees and turns to his new friends. It's immediately clear that they weren't thinking of the manager. You got us barred, says the girl who didn't speak. I didn't mean to. You oughtn't have stood so close. Doesn't matter what you meant, she says, and the other girl adds, We'll be standing a lot closer, standing on your head. Mark can't take refuge in the cinema, but running would look shameful and invite pursuit as well. Instead, he tramps at speed across the car park. His shadow lurches ahead, growing paler as it stretches, and before long it has company, jerking forward to catch up on either side of him. He still stops short of bolting, but strides faster. He's hoping passers-by will notice his predicament, but either they aren't interested or they're determined not to be. At last he reaches the nightclubs and is opening his mouth to appeal to the nearest doorman when the fellow says, Keep walking, lad. They're after me. The doorman barely glances beyond Mark and his face stays blank. Walk on. It could be advice, though it sounds like a dismissal. It leaves Mark feeling that he has been identified as an outsider, and he thinks the doorman's impassive faces are warning him not to loiter. He would make for the police station if he knew where it was. 
He mustn't go to his grandparents' house in case they become scapegoats as well, and there's just one sanctuary he can think of. He dodges into the side street, towards the bingo hall. The street looks decades older than the main road, and as though it has been forgotten for at least that long. Three street lamps illuminate the cracked roadway bordered by grids that are clogged with old leaves. The glow is too dim to penetrate the gaps between the boards that have boxed up the shop fronts, because the lanterns are draped with grey cobwebs laden with drained insects. The only sign of life apart from a rush of footsteps behind Mark is the amplified voice, still delivering its blurred chant. It might almost be calling out to him. And he breaks into a run. So do his pursuers, and he's afraid that the bingo hall may be locked against intruders. Beyond the grubby glass of three pairs of doors, the foyer is deserted. Nobody is in the ticket booth or behind the refreshment counter. His pursuers hesitate as he sprints to the nearest pair of doors, but when neither door budges, the gang closes in on him. He nearly trips on the uneven marble steps as he stumbles along them. He throws all his weight, such as it is, against the next set of doors, which gives so readily that he almost sprawls on the threadbare carpet of the foyer. The caller seems to raise his voice to greet him. Sixty-three, he's announcing, just like me. The pursuers glare at Mark from the foot of the shallow steps. You can't stay in there, one girl advises him, and the other shouts, Better not try. All the gang look determined to wait for him. If they don't tire of it by the time the bingo players go home, surely they won't dare to let themselves be identified, and so Mark shuts the doors and crosses the foyer. The entrance to the auditorium is flanked by old theatrical posters, more than one of which depicts a plump comedian with a sly schoolboyish face. Mark could imagine they're sharing a joke about him as he pushes open the doors to the auditorium. The theater seats have been cleared out, but the stage remains. It faces a couple of dozen tables, most of which are surrounded by women with scorecards in front of them and stumpy pencils in their hands. The stage is occupied by a massive lectern bearing a large transparent globe full of numbered balls. Mark might fancy that he knows why the posters looked secretly amused, because the man in them is behind the lectern. He looks decades older, and the weight of his face has tugged it piebald as well as out of shape, but his grin hasn't entirely lost its mischief, however worn it seems. Presumably his oversized suit and baggy shirt are meant to appear comical rather than to suggest a youngster wearing cast-off clothes. He examines a ball before returning it to the globe, which he spins on its pivot. Three and three, he says as his eyes gleam blearily at Mark. What do you see? he adds, and all the women eye the newcomer. At first Mark can't see his grandmother. He's distracted by a lanky, angular woman who extends her speckled arms across the table nearest to him. Lost your mammy, son? She cries, there's plenty here to tend to you. For an uneasy moment, he thinks she has reached for her breast to indicate how motherly she is. But she's adjusting her dress, her eagerness to welcome him having exposed a mound of wrinkled flesh. Before he can think of an answer, his grandmother calls. What are you doing here, Mark? She's at a table close to the stage. He doesn't want to make her nervous for him if there's no need, and he's ashamed of having run away. The uncarpeted floorboards amplify every step he takes, so that he feels as if he's trying to sound bigger than he is. All the women and the bingo caller watch his progress, and he wonders if everybody hears him mutter. I went to the cinema, but they wouldn't let me see the film. As his grandmother makes to speak, one of her three companions leans forward, flattening her forearms on the table to twice their width. However old are you, son? Mark's thirteen, says his grandmother. Another of her friends nods vigorously, which she has been doing ever since Mark caught sight of her. Thirteen, she announces, and many of the women coo or hoot with enthusiasm. Looks old enough to me says the third of his grandmother's table mates, who is sporting more of a moustache than Mark has achieved. 
Enough of a man. Well, we've shown you off now, Mark's grandmother tells him. I'll see you back at home. This provokes groans throughout the auditorium. The woman who asked his age raises her hands and her forearms sag toward the elbows. Don't keep him to yourself, Lottie. The nodding woman darts to grab a chair for him. You make this the lucky table, Mark. He's disconcerted to observe how frail his grandmother is by comparison with her friends, though they're at least as old as she is. The bingo caller gives him a crooked grin and shouts, Glad to have another fellow here. Safety in numbers, lad. Presumably this is a joke of some kind, since quite a few women giggle. Mark's grandmother doesn't, but says, Can he have a card? This prompts another kind of laughter, and the nodding woman even manages to shake her head. It's the women's game, lad, the caller says. Are you ladies ready to play? More than ever, the mustached woman shouts, which seems somehow to antagonize Mark's grandmother. Sit down if you're going to, she says. Stop drawing attention to yourself. He could retort that she has just done that to him. He's unable to hide his blazing face as he crouches on the spindly chair while the bingo caller elevates the next ball from the dispenser. Eighty-seven, he reads out. Close to heaven. The phrase earns mirth and other noises of appreciation as the women duck in unison to their cards. They chortle or grunt if they find the number grimacing if they fail. Nobody at Mark's table has located it when the man at the lectern calls, Number forty, old and naughty. That's us and no mistake. The mustached woman screeches before whooping at the number on her card. Number six, up to tricks. That sells as well, her friend cries, but all her nodding doesn't earn her the number. Forty-nine! You'll be fine! The third woman crosses out the number and flesh cascades down her arm as she lifts the pencil. He's that with bales on, she says, favoring Mark with a wink. He has to respond, though the smile feels as if his swollen lips are tugging at his hot, stiff face. Three and twenty! The man at the lectern intones, There'll be plenty. Mark's grandmother hunches over the table. He could think she's trying to evade the phrase or the coups of delight it elicits from the rest of the players, but she's marking the number on her card. She seems anxious to win, staying bent close to the card as the bingo caller consults the next ball. Six and thirty, he says, and a roguish grin twists the left side of his mouth. Let's get dirty. He pokes at the grin with a finger as if he wants to push the words back in. Although they've raised appreciative squeals throughout the auditorium, the fleshy woman falls to her card so eagerly that every visible part of her wobbles. That'll do me, she cries. Presumably she means his suggestion since she hasn't completed her card. Mark sees his grandmother glance nervously at it and then stare down at her own as though striving to conjure up a number. Four and four, the caller says, and almost at once, there's the door. The mustached woman rubs her upper lip so hard that Mark fancies he hears the hairs crackle. Never mind that, she tells the caller. He blinks at her and stares around the hall. Mark feels more out of place than ever, as though he's listening to jokes too old for him. Beyond his comprehension, at any rate. The caller's drooping face grows defiant as he identifies the next ball. Ninety-five, he says. Leave alive. This brings no laughter, just a murmur that falls short of words. At least Mark's grandmother has found the number on her card. She needs three more to win, and he's surprised by how much he hopes she will. He puts the wish into his eyes as he gazes up at the stage. Number fifty, the caller says in a tone that seems almost as mechanical as the dispenser. 
He'll be nifty. I, several women respond, and the quivering woman gives Mark another wink. Eighty-one, nearly done. That's me. The nodding woman agrees, bowing to her card as if the motion of her head has overtaken the rest of her. Perhaps she means her age, since the irregular cross she makes doesn't finish off the card. Twenty-nine. The caller says, keeping his eyes on the ball he's raised between the fingertips of both hands. See the sign. If the players do so, they keep quiet about it, not even greeting the number or bemoaning their luck. The caller displays the next ball like a magician and puts a finger to the edge of a grin that's meant to appear mysterious. Sixty-three, he says. Time to flee. The murmur this provokes is unamused, and he concentrates on the ball that rolls out of the dispenser. Twenty-four, he says. Can't do more. His gaze is drifting towards Mark when the fleshy woman emits a shriek that jabs deep into the boy's ears. We're done, she cries. It's mine. The caller shuts the globe and extends a hand. Give us a look. As she mounts the steps to the stage, a series of tremors passes through her body, starting at her venous legs. Having checked her numbers against those that came up, the caller says, We've a winner! She snatches the card and plods back to the table, where Mark sees how the crosses resemble sketches of gravestones, at least until she turns the card the right way up. She lowers herself onto her creaking chair and says, I claim the special. The caller doesn't look at her or anyone near her. It's not time yet, he tells whoever needs to hear. While he leans on the lectern to say so, he puts Mark in mind of a priest on a pulpit. Though the comparison seems wrong in some way, Mark doesn't understand. He's distracted by his grandmother, who lays her pencil down next to the card scattered with the kinds of crosses all the women have been drawing. I'll do without my luck tonight, she says, and grasps his arm to help her stand up. Time someone was at home. Don't be like that, the fleshy woman says. You can't just go running off. I won't be running anywhere. As Mark wonders whether that's defiance or the painful truth, his grandmother says, I'll see you all another night. See us now and see yourself. The speaker nods so violently that her words grow jagged. You're still one of us. I'm not arguing, Mark's grandmother says and grips his arm harder. Come along now, Mark. He doesn't know how many women murmur as she turns towards the exit. While he can't make out their words, they sound unhappy if not worse. And all of them are closer than the exit. Nobody moves as long as he can see them, and he finds he would rather not look back. His grandmother has almost led him out, clutching his arm so tightly that it throbs when the lanky woman who first greeted him plants a hand on her breast again. Though she could be expressing emotion, Mark has the unwelcome fancy that she's about to bear the wizened breast to him. His grandmother hurries him past, and the doors to the foyer are lumbering shut behind them when a woman says, we aren't done. Mark hopes she's addressing the man on the stage, urging him to start the next game, but he hasn't heard the caller by the time he and his grandmother emerge onto the steps. The street is deserted, and he suspects that the couples who followed him from the cinema are long gone. Outside the clubs, the doormen keep their faces blank at the sight of him and his escort, who is leaning on him as much as leading him. She's quiet until they reach the shops, where she mutters, I wish you hadn't gone there tonight, Mark. We're meant to be responsible for you. He feels guiltier than he understands. She says nothing more while they make their increasingly slow way home. She's about to ring the doorbell with her free hand when Mark produces the key. Isn't he in? She protests. He went to the pub. Men, she says so fiercely that Mark feels sentenced, too.
She slams the door by tottering against it and says, I think you should be in your bed. He could object that it isn't his bedtime, that he doesn't know what offense he's committed, but perhaps he isn't being punished, in which case he isn't sure he wants to learn her reason for sending him to his room. He trudges up the narrow boxed-in stairs to the decidedly compact bathroom, where every item seems too close to him, not least the speckled mirror that frames his uneasy face. The toothpaste tastes harsher than usual, and he does his best to stay inaudible while spitting it into the sink. As he dodges into the smaller of the two front bedrooms, he sees his grandmother sitting at the bottom of the stairs. He retreats under the quilt of the single bed against the wall beneath the meager window and listens for his grandfather. He doesn't know how long he has kept his eyes shut by the time he hears the front door open below him. His grandmother starts to talk at once, and he strains to catch her words. Did you send Mark to fetch me tonight? I told him to stay clear, Mark's grandfather says not quite as low. What did he say? It isn't what he saw, it's what they did. Are you still up to that old stuff? Makes you all feel powerful, does it? I'll tell you one thing, Len. You don't anymore. Just as righteously, she says, I don't remember you crying about it too much when it was your turn. Well, it's not now. It shouldn't be our house at all. This sounds accusing, especially when she adds, If there's any talking to be done, you can do it. Apparently that's all. Mark hears his grandparents labor up the stairs and take turns to make various noises in the bathroom that remind him how old they are. He finds himself wondering almost at random whether they'll take him to the celebrations tomorrow on the town green. They have on other May days. The prospect feels like a reward, if not a compensation for some task. The door of the other front bedroom shuts, and he hears a series of creaks that mean his grandparents have taken to their bed. For a while, the night is almost quiet enough to let him drift into sleep, except that he feels as if the entire house is alert. He's close to dozing when he hears a distant commotion. At first, he thinks a doorman outside a club is shouting at someone, perhaps a bunch of drunks since several people respond. There's something odd about the voice and the responses, too. Mark lifts his head from the lumpy pillow and strives to identify what he's hearing, and then he realizes his efforts are unnecessary. The voice and its companions are approaching through the town. Mark does his best to think he's misinterpreting what he hears. The voices sound uncomfortably close by the time he can't mistake them. Seventy-four, the leader calls, and the ragged chorus answers, Knock on his door! Mark is additionally disconcerted by recognizing that the caller isn't the man who was on the stage. However large and resonant it is, it's a woman's voice. Number ten! It calls, and the chant responds, Find the men! The chorus is nearly in unison now, and the performance puts Mark in mind of a priest and a congregation, some kind of ritual, at any rate. He kicks the quilt away and kneels on the yielding mattress to scrag the curtain and peer through the window. Even when he presses his cheek against the cold glass, all of the street that he can see is deserted. His breath swells up on the pane and shrinks as the first voice cries, Sweet Thirteen! And the rest chant, While he's green! They sound surer of themselves with every utterance. And they aren't all that troubles Mark. Although he knows that the houses opposite are occupied, every window is dark and not a single curtain stirs. Is everyone afraid to look? Why are his grandparents silent? For a few of Mark's breaths, the nocturnal voices are, too. But he can hear a muffled shuffling, the noise of a determined march. Then the caller announces, Pair of fives! And as her followers chant, We're the wives! The procession appears at the end of the road. It's led by the fleshy woman.
As she advances up the middle of the street, she's followed by her mustached friend and the nodding one. And then their fellow players limp or trot or hobble in pairs around the corner. The orange glow of the street lamp lends them a rusty tinge like an unnatural tan. Mark doesn't need to count them to be certain that the parade includes everybody from the bingo hall except the man who was on stage and Mark's grandmother. As his grip on the windowsill bruises his fingers, the fleshy woman declares, Ninety-eight! She has a handful of bingo cards and is reading out the numbers. We're his fate! The procession declares with enthusiasm, and Mark sees eyes glitter, not only with the streetlight. The mustached woman wipes her upper lip with a finger and thumb while her partner in the procession nods so eagerly that she looks in danger of succumbing to a fit. Eighty-nine! Their leader intones as if she's reading from a missile, and the parade almost as long as the street chants, He'll be mine! They're close enough for Mark to see the fleshy woman join in the response. He sees her quivering from head to foot with every step she takes toward him, and then his attention is caught by the lanky woman in the middle of the procession. She's by no means alone in fumbling at a breast as though she's impatient to give it the air. That's among the reasons why Mark lets go of the curtain and the windowsill to huddle under the quilt. Once upon a time he might have believed this would hide him, but it doesn't even shut out the voices below the window. Twenty-four, the caller shouts and joins in the chant of, Here's the door! This is entirely too accurate for Mark's liking. It's the number of the house. As he hugs his knees with his clasped arms and grinds his spine against the wall, he hears a muffled rumble close to him. Someone has opened the window of the next bedroom. Mark holds his breath until his grandfather shouts, Not here! Like Lottie says, you've been here once. That was a long time ago, Len. Mark can't tell whether this is reminiscent or dismissive, but the tone doesn't quite leave the fleshy woman's voice as she said, It's either you or him. After a pause, the window rumbles shut, and Mark finds it hard to breathe. He hears footsteps padding down the stairs, whose he doesn't know, and the front door judders open. This is followed by an outburst of shuffling, first in the street and almost at once, to some extent, inside the house. As it begins to mount the stairs, Mark hears the caller's voice, though it's little more than a whisper. Number one, she prompts, and a murmuring chorus responds, Let's be mum. Is it proposing a role to play or enjoining secrecy? Mark can't judge, even when the procession sets about chanting in a whisper, Mum, mum, mum. The repetition seems to fill the house, which feels too small for it, especially once the front door closes behind the last of the procession. The chorus can't blot out the shuffling, which sounds like the restlessness of an impatient cue. All Mark can do is squeeze his eyes so tight that the darkness throbs in time with his pulse, and he manages not to look until he hears a door creep open. Two Poems for Hill House by Kevin McCann Answered an ad. Pulls the apartment door towards her, slowly clicks it shut. Picks up her bag, packed for who knows. Pads down back stairs, slips on her shoes, clack taps echoing the basement car park, finds her old Ford. Still starts first time. Drives up the ramp, checks right and left, no traffic yet. Rereads the directions that came with this note. Rolls down her window, grips the wheel, gulping. At long last sets off. Chalked my name on the sidewalk, watched that night as rain washed it away. Reaches the freeway. Still early. 
still quiet, but takes the highway instead as her sister wakes up crying, makes coffee until it's late enough to phone. A shower of stones cracked our roof tiles. Mother said it was neighbors who've never liked us at all. Mid-morning, she stops at a diner, drinks coffee, has doughnuts for breakfast, smokes openly as she leaves, brushing some man, beery breath, who whistles, and the wheels on the car go round and round, and past a cop parked by some billboard, asleep, round and round and round, overtakes a school bus, jaundiced, Empty round and reaches her turn-off, checks herself in the mirror, smiles, practicing. I am the one who set out that morning instructions laid out on the passenger seat. I am the one who, after driving all day, slowed through that town, but when I wound down my window to ask last-minute directions, had my pardon me, sir, or excuse me there, ma'am, get no more response than some panhandling bum. I am the one who was last to arrive, so the gatekeeper told me, then smiled at his wife. I am the one who followed the slowly last curving stretch, and when the house pounced, as I rounded the curve, just past the tree stump, hung in a vacuum, head in a vice, cold, freshly scalped. I am the one whose mind changed right there. I am the one who turned back. Mariner's Round by Terry Dowling it started small, as these things do, with a cheap glass jewel pried from the rump of a genuine Charles Carmel merry-go-round horse at Sydney's Luna Park one cool autumn evening in 1977. A blue glass jewel set into a gold-painted wooden harness, many-faceted, the size of a king's thumbnail, a queen's ransom, big enough to be easily visible and look so precious to kids watching the carousel turn. Easy to pry off, too. In a small enough act of vandalism by one of the three fourteen year old schoolboys on a cool, just past summer evening. Davy Renford wanted it, yearned for it, loved the idea of having a precious blue glass jewel from the haunch of a magnificent white wooden horse he'd chosen. Lysander the chest blazon said, and it was on the outermost of the three rings, a smooth-turning stander, not like the favored lift-and-fall jumpers on the two inner rings that most boys preferred. The fixed ones were not as exciting to ride, but being on the outside, they had the armor and bright fish-scale saddle cloths, the mirrors and the jewels. And this, to Davy, was the finest mount of them all, picked from the forty-two others chosen over the two chariots, the lion and the fabulous oh-so-tempting griffin. There was something about its dark gaze, the arch of the neck, the way the splendid creature lunged forward to seize the knight. Davy couldn't explain exactly. Stallion or mare, it didn't matter. This was his horse, his jewel. Something to mark the time. Riley Trencher couldn't have cared less, not yet. He was on an inner ring jumper, four horses ahead, yelling something back to Frank Coombs, who was busy swapping horses mid-ride when the operator wasn't looking. And it was just as Davy's cousin, Frank, was swinging between a second ring jumper and the outer ring fixed black behind Davy's that he saw Davy reach back to run his finger yet again over the blue gem in the golden harness. You want it? Take it! Frank said. It's just glass. Which it was, of course, yet could never be. Take it, Frank said again. Davy couldn't. But for Frank Coombs, it wasn't an issue. He glanced at Riley Trencher sailing on ahead, then at the operator whose back was still turned, then in seconds had his penknife out and open and the blade in under the jewel. In seconds, he was cupping the cool, hard thing as it came away, then passing it forward to Davy, who took it, gaping in shock and wonder. 
What's that you're doing? Riley called, which made the operator turn, shout in automatic, Behave yourselves, you boys! And ended the conversation until the ride was over. By the time the platform had glided to a halt and all the horses were fixed and still, Riley and Frank had forgotten the jewel. They were too busy hurrying off to the ghost train, leaving Davy to follow on, lost in the buzz of wondering if it had really happened. It was on the way home that Riley became the closest thing to an enemy Davy had ever known. The three of them were off the train at Hornsby, walking down Sutter's Lane with the backyards of homes to one side and the vast open spread of the railway lines to the other. There was a street light ahead, just before the pedestrian underpass, and in the thin yellow light Frank saw how distracted Davy was. Hey, Davy boy, why the long face? You got the jewel? Which had Riley immediately demanding to see it. Hey, yeah, I wondered what you two were doing. Show me. Davy would have refused, but it wasn't worth setting Riley off about anything. He was like a spring on its first flex, a firework teased with fire. Davy took the jewel from his back pocket and passed it over. Maybe it looked precious in the light. Maybe it triggered something in Riley Trencher that had never existed before. For in a flash, mere seconds, his arm was back and he was flinging the stone out across the tracks. For Davy it was a frozen moment an eternity of alarm, dismay, rage beyond telling. He couldn't speak, couldn't move. Not so, Frank. An instant more and Frank had his own arm back and was punching Riley full in the face, spinning him off balance, sending him careening down the embankment. The chain-link fence should have caught him, but other kids had loosened the mesh for a shortcut and Riley went plunging through, scrambling and yelling, landing hard at the bottom on a standing length of pipe that went through his left thigh. The yelling roused the neighbors. Suddenly there were adults there, and police, and an ambulance soon afterwards. But by then Davy and Frank had been led aside, questioned and taken home. So it is that things happen. Lives are turned. Debts left owed and owing. Twenty-five years later, David Renford, Dave to his close friends, still Davy to his closest, knew so much more about the jewel, or rather the horse and the merry-go-round they had ridden that fateful night. Even before becoming a freelance heritage analyst, even before being called in to do insurance appraisals on two different Luna Park gates and associated vintage attractions by various state governments, he had learned its origins how it was an American three-row menagerie carousel in the Coney Island style purchased in England by Herman Phillips and brought to Sydney in 1910, how the horses had been carved by Charles Carmel, one of the greatest of the American carousel horse carvers of the early 20th century, a student of Charles Loof himself, and who, as an independent competitor, had specialized in splendid armored mounts, fish-scale saddle blankets, and feather pattern jeweled harnesses. And twenty-five years to the day of that momentous evening, though he wasn't to know that for another hour or so, Davy was sitting in the Treberon in Dublin at one forty-five on an overcast Saturday afternoon listening to a five-piece band playing Whiskey in the Jar. There was a petite, red-headed woman with a winsome, heart-shaped face, drinking with friends and singing along who kept catching his eye and smiling the right way. Losing on-again, off-again Tina had made him cautious, even shy, and he meant to wait before attempting any kind of overture. What if he were wrong? Still, it was the first time he'd been really, truly, unequivocally happy in the five years since Annie died, and it had started with winning the lucky door prize at the local RSL. The return trip to Ireland with three weeks' accommodation and three thousand dollars spending money. He felt his life remaking itself at last. But then, sheer astonishment, Frank Coombs walked in. Frank or a time-worn look-alike. There was no mistaking him, though it had been ten years since he'd last seen his long-lost cousin, well before Annie. Frank, 
Davy called above the singing, and Frank heard and turned, eyes widening in recognition, mouth falling open in amazement to match Davy's own. Davy? What on earth? For the next thirty minutes they huddled over beers in that corner of the Trebaran just off O'Connell Street, though the surprises and delight turned to a different, darker sort of astonishment after the first few minutes. For Frank had won his own prize at another RSL, the three weeks' accommodation, the three thousand dollars. It was unbelievable, impossible, but more. On his way out of the hotel just forty minutes ago, Frank had been handed a most intriguing message at reception. Your next surprise, the bar of the Trebaran Hotel, 2 p.m. It had all been planned. The strictly fixed-term plane tickets, the proximity of their hotels, the meeting. "'What's going on, Dave?' Frank asked, more to the universe than his one-year-younger cousin. "'I thought you must have arranged the whole thing.' "'How I'm seeing it too, Frank. "'But what are the chances? "'Someone saw I was here and phoned your hotel.' They spoke on matched lives, found they had even more in common than they'd first thought. Davy had lost Annie five years before in a car accident in Royal National Park. Frank's wife, Marguerite, had left him a year ago, taking their remaining child to her parents' property at Callaway Point after a house fire had caused the death of their six-year-old son, Mark. The more they talked about their lives, the more alarming the symmetry became. Several years back, Davy had looked like becoming a favored heritage analyst for the Australian Museum in Sydney, until an elaborately staged hoax had led first to his being sidelined, then sidestepped altogether. Frank, on the other hand, had been forced to close a promising rural medical practice when a lawsuit from a woman whose cancer had been misdiagnosed led to a malpractice investigation. The pathology lab had ended up being held accountable, but, country towns being what they were, Frank's reputation in the district had been effectively ruined. "'Believe in conspiracy theories, Davy?' Frank asked. "'Starting to,' Davy answered. "'It's too weird.' The timing of this discovery phase had been planned as well. Forty-five minutes after their meeting, the waitress who came to clear the glasses handed them a business card. "'A gentleman upstairs asked me to give you this,' she said. "'He's in the private lounge on the first floor, room ten. No, she didn't know his name, just what was on the card. He'd booked the room, seemed a bit of a big spender. Then she hurried off about her duties before they could quiz her further. The card gave no other identification than Blue Circle International with a downtown New York address and contact details. On the reverse, someone had written in a neat script, There are things to discuss. Please join me for 3 p.m. Davy and Frank checked their watches, saw that it was five minutes of that. All of it planned. But answers. Answers now at last. They left their table and took the stairs to the first floor, continued along the hallway to the polished mahogany door of room ten. Davy and Frank exchanged glances, then Frank knocked, and they entered. The spacious room was unoccupied but for a tall man sitting in a leather armchair before the fire. He was their age, late forties, early fifties, and had a head full of graying hair, a neatly trimmed beard. There was a walking stick by his left hand, and his suit looked expensive. Two more armchairs were arranged near his, and a small table was set with an ice bucket and a bottle of champagne, three glasses, a modest if ample plate of sandwiches and cakes. The man turned in his chair, smiled. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Excuse me if I don't get up. An old injury. We got your card. Davy said, settling in one of the armchairs. And your plane tickets, Frank added, taking the other. An explanation would be appreciated. Of course, Frank, the bearded man said, and please help yourselves to the sandwiches. Davy, do the honours and pour us each a glass. You've come a long way and we have things to celebrate. We do, 
Frank asked, even as Davy twigged to it. Riley, it's you. Indeed it is, Davy boy. Good to see you. You too, Frank. Good of you to come. There was a strange silence then, absurd under the circumstances, and Davy eased them through it by opening the bottle, filling the champagne flutes and passing them out. Thought we should catch up, Riley said when they had all the glasses, twenty-five years ago today. Today, you realize. Frank had lost things from his life. He needed to gain control here. Riley, none of that was meant to happen. Of course it wasn't, Frank. We were kids. I was a jerk. But twenty-five years. Different hemisphere, different country, but this date. And here we are. Davy returned the bottle to the ice bucket. It was vintage Krug. You seem to have done well. Based in New York now. Married into old money. Spend my time running Blue Circle, mainly antiquities auctions. One of the top five auction houses on the East Coast. Who would have thought? But here's to your health. They all drank the toast. So why the beat up, Riley? Frank said when it was done. It's a long way for an anniversary drink. Afraid we wouldn't come? Riley set down his glass and laced his fingers. Frank, it's more to do with completing an old formula, an old incantation, if you can believe it. An incantation? Frank was first puzzled, then annoyed. As he'd just told Davy down in the lounge, ever since the lawsuit, ever since Marky died, he'd sworn never to put up with bullshit again. Riley smiled. All right. A protocol, if you prefer. How something has to be done. Davy, you're in the trade. Ever hear of something called the Chinder Commission? The name's familiar. A carousel? Exactly. A menagerie merry-go-round. Charles Carmel worked on it after the fire destroyed his own new carousel in 1911. He was uninsured and he lost nearly everything. But before he died in 1933, he did some work for Horace Chinder. Frank set his glass on the table. Davy, Riley, how about you talk shop some other time? I want to know why we're here. Riley raised a hand in a placating gesture. Frank, please. What happened that night definitely has a place in this. That jewel you got for Davy. Davy was restless too, but saw that the best way to get answers was to play it as Riley wanted. He turned to his cousin. Frank, the carousel we rode back in 1977 was a Charles Carmel merry-go-round brought to Sydney from the U.S., sold back to a U.S. company after the 1979 ghost train fire. We might want to hear this. Frank settled back, let Davy top up his glass. All right, but make it the five-dollar version, OK? Riley grinned. The five-dollar version it is. Chinda was a stage magician, grandson and great-grandson in a family of very successful stage magicians. He was into puzzles and tricks, creating mysterious objects and events. A bit like that Kit Williams fellow. Like who? Frank asked. Kit Williams. Back in the 70s, he made a hair out of gold, set it with jewels and buried it in the countryside then published a picture book with clues to its whereabouts so a lucky treasure hunter could find it. Masquerade. Do a net search. Chinder was like that, only he did it with a carousel. Oh, and why is that? For all Davy knew, Frank might have been trying to behave, but his words came over as sarcasm. Riley seemed not to notice. Well, it's a sacred shape, isn't it? The wheel of life, like the round table. No beginning or end. Anyway, you can't stoppeth one of three unless you have three to start with, yes? Just like in 77. That's a Coleridge reference. 
Davy said for Frank's benefit, in case his cousin didn't know the illusion. The rhyme of the ancient mariner. Gee, I was just going to say that, Frank added. Five dollar version, Riley. Gotcha. But it was Chinder's favourite poem, Riley continued. And his favourite line was the first one. It was an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. He had it inscribed on the marquee of the mariner's round, the carousel he had made for him, all fancy curlicue so you can barely read it. At least it's supposed to be there, hidden in plain sight, and it's a clue. To what? Frank asked. Exactly, Frank. It was comical. Riley was ignoring Frank's impatience and irritation, was treating him as if he were a fellow devotee, an interested colleague and ally. To what, indeed? That's where you can help. I've located the Chinder Carousel. Now it's a matter of solving the clues. All I need is an hour of your time. Frank shook his head in amazement. That's it? We're here to solve a puzzle? Riley remained unshakably charming and enthusiastic. I've done a lot of work already. I'm nearly there. It has to do with the real purpose behind the Chinder Commission. Why these particular mounts, what they were intended to do. To do? To make possible. Incredibly, there was another silence then, just the sound of the fire crackling and of traffic out in the street. Quite possibly the champagne and the warmth were having their effect, for when Frank next spoke, it was as if he had worked through the absurdities and the impossibility, had found other things to settle on for a time, other memories, possibly a clearer sense of the reality of this unique moment in their lives. Never thought of people having careers carving carousel horses, was all he said. Riley seized on the change of mood, handled Frank, as he was no doubt handling them both. I know, and you can't imagine what a competitive, quirky bunch they were, Frank. One of them, Marcus Illions, had highly trained assistants, but insisted on carving every horse head himself. Just the heads, think of it. Solomon Stein and Harry Goldstein turned out really quite frightening mounts with big heads and large teeth, quite ferocious looking, like they were deliberately trying to frighten the children they were meant to attract. But most manufacturers just did the frames and hired carvers to provide what was needed. That one we rode as kids was a real beauty. Bit of a hybrid, not quite the usual caramel menagerie. Mostly horses, but there was a lion, a griffin, and two chariots for variety. We remember, Frank said, the edginess returning. Riley picked up his glass of Krug, though barely drank. Right, how can we forget? Something else was there to stop it one of three that night. Riley, we were kids. Davy reminded him in case it was needed. Let it go. Hey, they saved the leg. I've done well. Riley became thoughtful again. But it's strange, Davy. You seem to know Carmel's work, but nothing about the commission. Just heard the name somewhere. Right, but you probably know that when the fire destroyed his own carousel, Carmel was a broken man. He had to take whatever work he could get. I'm not saying it was arson, but suddenly Chinder comes along wanting a special menagerie, unlike any Carmel had worked on before. All conveniently omitted from the biographies, Davy said. I get piecework, diabetes, worsening arthritis, dead of cancer in his mid-sixties. Strict secrecy was part of the brief. Carmel went to a dockside location in Brooklyn, used only the most trusted assistants. We know so little about it, just that it had a nautical theme and took two years to complete. Chinder was very specific about what had to be included. 
He also provided the materials. Can you guess what they were? Just tell us, Frank said. The timbers from wrecked sailing ships, Frank. Every single sea mount for the Chinder Commission was made from the bullocks and ribbing of old trading ships, from wrecks washed ashore, buried or never appraised properly. Timbers from storm-damaged vessels or hulks turned in for salvage. Frank had reached his patience limit again. Great, so how does the jewel fit in? Precisely the right word, Frank. Fit. Something being fitted, and since it has to do with the three of us, refitted. All three involved, like in the poem. It wasn't what Coleridge had meant at all, Davy wanted to remind him, but he was looking out for Frank. One of three, that poem says Riley. Every three people the mariner would stop one to tell his story to. Right, Davy boy. A bit melodramatic, pushing the image, I know, but circumstances make it relevant. You wanted the jewel back then. Frank took it. I ended up with it. Only fitting, don't you think? Ended up with it, was Davy's immediate thought, but his cousin spoke first. You throw it away! Frank's words were too loud in the otherwise empty room. Riley's eyes flashed in the firelight. Did I now? He gave a strange, somehow nasty, possibly exulting grin. Davy wasn't sure how to read it. Time to put this on again, I think. He took a silver ring from his jacket pocket and slipped it onto his right ring finger. It was handsome, but too large, too overdone. And set into the crown was the blue glass jewel pried loose all those years ago. Davy sat stunned. Blue Circle International. That name, of course. But how? You bastard trencher, Frank muttered, even as Riley answered. I palmed it. What did you think I did? Davy and Frank glanced at each other. The implications spun out before them. Riley, Davy began. He never got to tell them he had it. It happened so quickly, too quickly, all the violence for nothing. You two nearly ruined my life, Riley continued. For a while, I even got to thinking that maybe I should ruin yours a bit. Say again, Frank demanded. What's that? Davy said. But Riley had regained whatever composure the rush of feeling had brought undone. He reached down and laid a hand on his walking stick, then regarded the cousins again. Still, that was then. This afternoon I have something important to show you. Frank was leaning forward, hands on his knees. Finish what you were saying. Frank, bear with me a bit longer, please. You've come a long way. The Blue Circle offices are in New York. You should be asking yourselves, why here? Why Dublin? The carousel's here, Davy said before Frank could speak. Right on, Davy boy. So think back to that night. Those horses had names. What was the one you rode? The one Frank took the jewel from. Do you remember? How could Davy forget? Lysander. Now it was Riley whose face showed surprise. More than that, astonishment. He went very still, not blinking for ten, twenty, thirty seconds. Then he reached up and stroked his beard with one hand almost absent-mindedly. He probably didn't know he was doing it. Riley, what? Davy asked. Lysander. Riley said at last. His manner had changed. He was still distracted, but now seemed shrewd and calculating as well. Yes, so? Riley brought his attention back to the cousins. Part of what got me into this. The auctions, maritime archaeology, all of it. There was a 17th century spice trader with that name. 
98 footer, three mests, went missing at sea in 1704 by all reports. He took out a pen and notebook. Davy, how was that spilt, please? He wrote the name as Davy spelled it, then saying, Excuse me a moment, took out his mobile and called a preset number. Beverly, I have the name. It's Lysander, spelled L-Y-S-A-N-D-E-R. Within half an hour, please. He broke the connection. Frank was still sitting forward as if preparing to leave. Riley, something important to show us, you were saying. I assume it's this carousel. Gents, just one more hour. That's all I ask. Riley was not only back in control, but seemed to have reconsidered how much he would reveal. Davy, it may help to see it as Chinda must have. He pondered the old questions. What is the role of magic in a life? Not necessarily real magic. Working magic, as they say, but our relationship to magic as an idea. A constant. Something wished for. Magic? Davy was thrown by the sudden change of topic, then realized that the coincidence with the names had changed everything. Saw, too, that Riley was probably working to a schedule, filling time. I know, crazy stuff, but as a historical, cultural, personal thing, we keep yearning for, keep returning to, the possibility of it. Frank made a disgusted sound. Riley, what are you going on about? Real magic? Working magic? What is all this? But Davy raised a hand this time, urging patience. You're saying Chinda sought more than just the conceptual kind? Davy, he did. We're talking real magic here, I promise you. The real deal. He turned back to Frank. Chinda made his career exploiting the other kind, Frank, the conceptual kind, pandering to our yearnings, manipulating our need to believe. He was an entertainer, but his papers show he actually did believe in working magic as well. He spent much of his life finding ways to use it. Frank breathed out heavily. Oh, for Pete's sake! But he too saw the glint in Riley's eyes, no doubt grasped that it was quite likely from exaltation at a quest nearly completed, something about to reach its end. The Chinda Commission was the culmination of his efforts, Riley said, some ancient, Kabbalistic, shamanistic way of reaching his goal. Davy had to ask, Which was? Why? Finding the heart's desire, of course, nothing less. That's how his papers put it. Which for him was what? Riley shrugged. Chinda doesn't say. And if I'm right, he never completed the process. But that's what it was, finding his heart's desire. Frank shook his head in disbelief. Which for you would be locating this old ship, using this bloke's carousel. An indulgence, Frank. We all have them. Though much more than that, Davy knew, fascinated in spite of himself. After the long flight, after winning the prize that wasn't the prize, the shock of meeting first Frank and now Riley again, this was something familiar, something to anchor him. Riley, the commission was never displayed, never seen. Right, it was picked up and shipped. Even Carmel never saw it reassembled. But you've located it. Davy, I have. It's out in the docklands, and I've bought it. Humour me, please. Come and see it now is all I ask. Then you can both go on your way. Enjoy your holiday. Frank stood, stepped away from his armchair. Riley, I've had enough. Frank, one thing, for old time's sake, please. All I ask, just ten minutes from here. 
Frank looked down at his one-time friend. Oh, Jesus. For old time's sake, then. The afternoon outside was bleak and wintry, and Davy wasn't surprised to see a higher car waiting for them at the curb. They climbed in and were driven, mostly in silence, through late afternoon traffic out to a dockland warehouse district, finally pulled over near a large brick building beside a chain-link fence. Davy could easily imagine a menagerie being hidden away in such a structure, but the building itself wasn't to be their destination. When they were standing in the road and the hire car had driven off, Riley used a key to unlock a gate in the fence, then led them down a path through by a construction yard to a high-fenced enclosure of a more traditional kind, a barricade of old wooden palings, sturdy and close-fitting. All about them could be heard the sounds of the Liffey. Riley unlocked a gate in that fence as well and held it open while they all stepped through. The cousins found themselves in a large, dim precinct formed by paling fences on all sides, even facing the river so there was no view at all, just the sound of gulls, with the smell of estuarine mudflats strong on the breeze. At first, Davy wasn't certain what he was seeing. Then, as his eyes adjusted in the last light of day, he saw that it was indeed a derelict carousel. Mariner's Round, the faded letters on the canopy said. And, sure enough, all the worn and time-damaged mounts he could make out were things of the deep, lunging, looming, crowding over each other. Some were based on real animals, sharks with gaping mouths, dolphins in mid-leap, whales sounding, spouting, a great squid with outthrust tentacles, a brace of seahorses side by side, the impressive spiral of a nautilus. But others were fanciful, wonderfully, disturbingly strange. A wild-eyed kraken, a sea serpent with a tabard of old mirrors, scrolling down its chest, half-human tritons and mermaids, all with heads that seemed larger than life, more in the style of Stein and Goldstein than Carmel, with bared teeth, rolling eyes, a manic, frantic, restless quality, like gasping things dragged from the depths before their time and against their wills. Davy couldn't help but be impressed. It did indeed seem to be the Chinder Carousel. Riley's lost caramel merry-go-round, seized, landed, and trapped here in this sad enclosure beside the Liffey. Not as derelict as it looks, Riley assured them. There's a new electric motor installed, though the musical accompaniment will be turned right down this evening. Mustn't draw too much attention but it'll work well enough for a little ride. Frank wasn't having any of it. And why would we want to do that? Frank, please, choose a mount and take the one ride. Just one? Riley, what's to be gained? Davy asked. Why does it matter so much? This jewel. He raised his ring. It was never meant to go to the carousel we rode in Sydney that night. But you never knew that, Davy. It was meant for this special hybrid, the Commission. There was a mix-up. Just the one jewel and it all went wrong for Chinder. Maybe a mischievous assistant palmed it, passed it on. Riley's grin was fierce. Maybe it was an honest mistake. Maybe the carousel itself wasn't ready but that's why it never worked as far as we can know, never fulfilled its function. Delivering the heart's desire, Davy said, echoing Riley's words from the hotel, even as his mind locked on what else Riley had just now said. Maybe the carousel itself wasn't ready. The heart's desire, Riley continued, something like that. But we found the jewel that night. I palmed it, had it in my pocket at the accident, and there was blood. It was blooded. Maybe that's it, you tell me. But the three of us were involved then. It seems right that all three have to be involved now. 
Chinder's papers, put it like that. All that is intended, the line goes. Well, all this was intended, is intended, as I see it. What we did then means it should be that way now. I'd already been tinkering with your lives a bit, getting even for what happened. There it was again, the hint of threat and reprisal. Frank seized on it. Wait, wait, what's that supposed to mean? And again, Riley ignored the question. Last year, I finally located the carousel here, arranged to buy it. Wait up, Riley! Frank's eyes flashed with anger. This wasn't a hotel lounge with torpor brought on by alcohol and a cozy fireside. This was a chill, naked evening with a fine drizzle beginning to fall. What do you mean, tinkering with our lies a bit? Then I brought you all this way. Now we take the ride, restore the jewel one way rather than another, and it's done. You can go. Go fuck yourself, Trencher, Frank said. What sort of tinkering? All through Frank's outburst, Riley seemed patient, even unnaturally calm. But Davy sensed the old Riley Trencher danger waiting there. Forget it, Riley, he said, more gently than he felt. We've seen enough. Riley gave a strange smile. Gents, you don't understand. I have more fun and games planned if you don't cooperate. Frank, right now, Marguerite is at Callaway Point with your daughter and your parents. Yes? Davy, your parents are still living in Chetswood. There are things in place. I need only say the word. I think one quick ride will be worth all the inconvenience. So please, choose a mount, finish what we started. What Chinda started. He left a silence then. Rather something of one, for it was filled with the soughing of the wind about the transoms and the canopy, getting in between the palings of the enclosure. Time seemed distended, every second stretched, laden. Davy and Frank stood in the growing gloom, numb with loss and grief all over again, feeling the helplessness, the rage and fury, the old embers smoldering now rekindled. For the first time, Davy saw his life as something deliberately spoiled. Not just the hoax, but Hell and Jesus, no, the accident. Annie. Other things that had been at least bearable as part of the burden of hazard in any life, but no longer. No longer. Frank had to be feeling the same, seeing Marky's death anew, the malpractice suit, losing Marguerite. What else had she been told in the careful, spiteful workings of Riley Trencher's plan? and Riley read that moment for precisely what it was, knew where it had led. He reached inside his jacket, produced a handgun, and aimed it their way. Think carefully about what you do now, gents. My associates are close by. Refuse to take the ride, and you'll be shot. You'll be stripped to a mount. We'll take the ride anyway. You don't have to be alive for it. Inside or out, the blood is still there. All that is intended. You killed my son, Frank said in a whisper, a ghost's voice drawn thin. Riley just tilted his head in a way that might have said, Collateral damage, Frank. I merely requested a house fire. Davy couldn't speak at all. The thought of Annie's death, of Riley's abiding hatred... That order of single-mindedness brought the familiar weight, the exhaustion. Only the search for this old carousel had stayed his hand, Davy realized, had brought this respite, this interlude, this whole parody of charm and civility. There'd be no going their own way once this was done, he was sure of it. And dying here wouldn't just end his own life, Davy saw, that was the thing. It would end Annie as well, somehow, 
the chance to keep her in the world in some way, any way. Just as Frank surviving, continuing, kept Marky's memory as something at least. We end, those things end. More forgotten things, the world moving on. The bleakness of the thought, the hour, this cold too early evening hour made it possible. Why not take the ride? Move it along, bring more hazard to the mix. Why not? He moved towards the carousel. As if on cue, three proximity floods switched on, ghost lighting the whole macabre display. Now glass eyes glittered in the time-struck faces, teeth gnashed. Flashed off-white and worn silver, tongues lolled, mouths silently screamed. Old mirrors gave the barest glints and gleams, ancient bright work showed in swatches, snatches, hints of fraught primary colors that had not been visible before. Davy didn't dare stop. The great squid impaled on its brass pole rolled a baleful eye, watched him approach, move past. Three mermaids offered scarred breasts, mouths flecked with old enamel. Mount us, mount us, ride. Sirens heaved, rolled, lolled in their meager twists of surf. No fish tails here, fancy boy. Press close. We can be Annie, Annie. Davy saw them through tears, flaunting, writhing, limbering. Tritons glared, daring, warning off. One lunged. No, no, it was Frank. Frank there with him now, circling the Zodiac too. This wheel of lost and forsaken things. Davy, his cousin began to say. Just do it. Davy said with a voice, a forthrightness neither Davy nor Frank had ever heard from him before. Move it along. But we have to. Frank, he has others with him. We've no choice. We don't know that. We don't know that at all. Doesn't matter which ones we choose. Just pick one near mine, okay? Stay close. Davy, we have to. Frank. There's been enough harm. Let it go. Get through this. And Frank did let it go then, like a balloon deflating, emptying, moved with Davy around this ancient wheel, sea changed, no, land changed, into a base, pathetic thing. Only one mount had a legible nameplate, a new plate, newly fitted. Lysander. Riley's mount this time, not his. Not now. Never his now. Davy moved clear of it well beyond, climbed atop a leaping dolphin on the outermost ring, one that looked less manic and blighted than the rest. Frank took the wild-eyed shark next in the row, climbed up and settled, gripped the pole. Riley must have already been in place back there behind them, for the platform began creaking, heaving, easing forward like a tide on the turn, moving faster and faster, girding itself like a king tsunami reaching to take on the world. The music would be playing, that was part of the equation too, but was turned right down as Riley had said it would be. There was just the creaking, the straining, the flapping of the old torn canopy, just the onshore breeze, laving, pushing, growing stronger, smelling of tidal flats, sea rack, and early rain. So, too, set running out there was the turn, turn of the city lights away off, and more lights from the river, scant, precious, locked in time. Those things shifting to a blur as the great wheel gained speed, completing itself by the act of moving forward. Animals, grotesques and halflings thrown, lunging, plunging into the flickering night, snatching the life of the flow, wheeling, rushing, flinging into time and chance, purest hazard. And caught in the sweep, that relentless rush, Davy almost saw it happen.
He came back to it, to everything, with a song, to words that went like this, Hoist away and make some sail, we'll have a toast for England. Tomorrow we're away to Spain or off to Araby. A man has many chains on shore, but Davy Jones has many more. He has no home, his wits are foam. He cannot leave the sea. Found himself in a corner of the Trebaron in Dublin on a wintry Saturday afternoon, woke to an old sea shanty being sung as a round, a round, yes, by two, three dozen men and women who were laughing, many with arms linked, raucously singing their parts. The pretty woman he'd seen before was still among them, smiling at him, coaxing, inviting, daring. He couldn't be wrong. So clear now through the refrain. Mariner's round, of course. Davy spared a thought for Frank and, unexpectedly, for Riley Trencher, wondering what had befallen them in this astonishing sleight of hand, sleight of mind, sleight of time. Because look where he was. Just look. And look at what he had. Davy laughed, found his feet, and went to join the chorus. Frank Coombs woke under the trees in the sea meadow above Callaway Point, looking out across the headland to the sparkling Pacific. When he heard laughter, the sound of children singing, he leant up on his elbows like some hayseed farm boy, saw the old farmhouse under its sheltering Morton Bay figs. Before it, there were adults dancing in a circle with ten, eleven children. A reel it was while other parents and friends watched, smiling, singing along, clapping in time. A round, Frank realized. It's a celebration, probably a birthday, and they're dancing a round. Come on, Frank, one of the spectators called, leaving the group approaching. It was Marguerite, worn, disheveled from the festivities and another handful of years, but Marguerite. You took the trouble to come. She said, least you can do is join in, unless you're too old for it. As if, Frank cried, for he wasn't. You never were. While you lived, you did what you could. Frank laughed. There was no Marky, no, that lasting bruise on the perfect day, but there was this, and surprisingly it was enough. He scrambled to his feet and went to join in, wanted Marguerite to see him doing that. Just that. And Riley Trencher? Why, Riley found himself on the ship of his dreams, of course. On the deck of the late 17th century spice trader Lysander, circling, endlessly circling, on the inner slope of a mighty maelstrom. A vast yawning gulf in the sea, at least two thousand meters across, five hundred deep, turning, roaring under a wild, leaden sky. The decks were canted at an alarming forty degrees above that terrible drop, but a crewman used sea lines to haul himself along the upper rail, finally arrived drenched by rain and spray. He wore the foul weather oilskins of an older time. You made it, he shouted above the roar of the vortex. They said you would. You've got the ring. What? Riley could barely hear his own voice. The roar numbed everything. What's that? The ring, man. You've got the bloody ring. And when Riley raised his hand to show it, the man nodded, actually managed a ragged grin. Thank God we can end this. And what? Riley asked, but knew, knew, even as the seaman gestured out at the gloom, the churning murk below. All that is intended. And after so many, too many, wasting, wearying years, the old ship leant harder into the wind, doors to crew quarters blew open, maps flew from the captain's cabin like doves, the twin mirrors of a sextant floated in a half-silvered sky, and Lysander began its final descent. Nanny Gray by Gemma Files
O low estate, my love, my love, the song's hook went, or seemed to, through the wall of the ladies. Bill Coslaw felt it more than heard it, buzzing in his back teeth through the sweaty skin of his jaws as he pushed into this toff tart. Cecily, he thought her name was, and the rest began with a K. From behind, with her bent over the lav itself, hands wide-braced, each thrust all but mashing that great midnight knot of hair against the cubicle's tiling. And he could see her lips moving, too, half-quirked in that smile he'd literally never seen her lose thus far. O oh, low estate, the threat is great, my love, my love, my love. Tiny girl, this Cecily Kay, almost creepily so. She looked barely legal, though he'd touched a cupcake-sized pair of breasts beneath that silky top of hers as she pulled him into the ladies, nipples long enough to tent the material and one apparently bar-pierced set inside a shield like a little silver flame, which pricked his hand when he'd tried to flick it, drawing blood. Oh, never mind that. She'd said, that smile intact, opaquely unreadable even as she'd leaned forward with her hips hiked high, flipping her skirt up to show her thong already moved neatly aside for easier penetration. Bit cruel to your knickers, he'd commented. Bet those cost a pretty penny. No doubt, she'd replied, bum still in the air with both legs wide spread, a slant on her two high heels, completely shameless. But then it all ends up in the fire eventually, doesn't it? Punctuating it a bit with a bit of a shimmy, like, Well, get a wiggle on. Don't waste my time, groundling. Better things to do, you know. Better classes of fools to fuck. That airy contempt of hers, especially when delivered in those plummy tones, engorged him. But he should be liking this better than he was, he reckoned. Some sort of aristocrat, perpetually drunk and perpetually talking, always with her credit card out like it was glued to her palm and no apparent impulse control to speak of. What wasn't to like, for Christ's sake? Just her, he supposed. Her and almost everything about her. He slid one hand up to ruck her blouse over her shoulder blades and flinched from what he encountered there. Something halfway between a grey-on-grey -gray tattoo of uncertain design and a brand with scabby edges, so rough it took on a braille-like texture beneath his fingers, as though, if he knew how, he could read it, but only in the dark. That a birthmark? Oh, we all have one. Your family? Some of them, too, yes. Who was it you meant, then? Oh, Billy, silly Billy. Does it really matter? And here she rammed back against him unexpectedly, throwing him off his beat, singing once more, this time out loud, as she took control of their rhythm. Oh, low estate, the threat is great, my love. Am I boring you? No, no, do carry on. What's that, then? Quite like this song is all. I'll stop, if you'd like. Wouldn't want to... Mmm, put you off. She shot him a glance back over her shoulder with that and reached back down between her legs to run one long nail over the seam of his sack. Inch-long nails, she had, white with black tips like some odd parody of a French manicure, each with a small black bedazzlement down where the cuticle should be. Pressing just hard enough to make him jump, so she could clamp around him and milk him so fiercely it began to hurt as she tossed a loose forelock out of her eyes and winked at him. Winked? Jesus wept. That, right there, as he grunted and came, listening to her give out a rippling laugh in reply, her own orgasm seeming very much like an afterthought, probably marked the exact point at which Bill stopped feeling anything like bad about always having planned to slip her a rohypnol and rob her house later on. Bill had come to London on a Contiki packet, planning to round-trip Europe before moving on to the next leg of his pre-uni world tour. But that had all been put paid to when this arsehole Gary from Tasmania decided he'd cheated him out of the proceeds from reselling a bag of weed they'd gone in on and took off with his stuff in revenge. 
Passport, money, tickets, the whole deal. Now it was three months later and Bill still hadn't quite worked himself up to the point where he was willing to tell the old man what had happened. Just kept on moving from place to place, bed to bed, sofa to sofa. Squatted here and there, took under-the-counter jobs and tried to build up some sort of pad. Going to clubs had become about the next ride home, the next overnight, and then, slowly but surely, about whatever he could pick up around the flat or the house or whatever before they woke up. Small items of value, gold and silver electronics. Stuff non-specific enough to pawn or fence without being traced, but nice enough they'd bring a fair turnaround. Girl like Cecily, wherever she lived, it had to be just full of stuff like that. A spread of hockable trinkets peppered in and between the lock, stock, and two smoking barrels type stuff. Antique firearms, paintings, and knick-knacks with nice pedigrees, etc. That was the assumption, anyhow. He'd long since learned to trust his instincts when it came to such matters, and it had paid off, literally. Hadn't been wrong once thus far. So, shouldn't there be somebody home this time of night? Bill asked as he half-walked, half-lifted her up the stairs. The place was dark, like nineteenth-century dark. It was the sort of towering three-story house that should really be lit with oil lamps, not cunning little sodium bulbs on dimmer switches. Place is a bloody tomb. Cecily's constant smile skewed a bit to the left, those horrifying nails making a slithery noise on the banister as she dragged them along its curve. Oh, there's very little staff left, you know. Family holidays, all that. Most of them have already gone down to air out the summer house for when I'm done with end of term. What about your parents? Hmm. Be quite surprised if they were here. They've both been dead since I was eight. Sorry? Oh, no need. Papa crashed a car and killed himself, but Mamma held on a few days in hospital at least. And ever after, it's just been me and Nanny Gray. As she spoke this last name, Bill almost thought he heard something drop in the dark above them, on the next landing, maybe, or higher up. A stealthy noise like a single clock tick, or the sound of a hairpin falling to the floor. Not footsteps, exactly but the dim stairwell and its adjacent hallways took on an air of waiting, of watchfulness, even though absolutely nothing which might be qualified to fill such a role evinced itself. You still have a nanny? Bill asked, pushing Cecily up onto what he thought was the second floor, where she laid a finger against her lips and shook her head drunkenly, then tottered over to a side table in those ludicrous heels, their clacking muffled by a thick oriental rug, and took out a long candle the color of bone that she fitted onto a nearby holder with an absurd little flourish, before rummaging in her purse for a cigarette and lighting it. She took a long drag, then pressed the tip against the candle's wick, which flared into life. Governess would be the proper term. That's what Nanny would say, anyhow. Such an old bulldog, Nanny Gray. So protective. She's always been with our family, you see. And here she paused, wavering back and forth, her eyes unfocused, yet still retained presence of mind enough to stub the smoke out in the candle holder's dish and blink over at Bill rather sweetly. Excuse me, she said. I feel rather off color all of a sudden. Might I rely on you to get me to bed? Slowest to take effect, Rohypnol, in all creation, Bill thought, amazed by her stamina. Ought to check my supply once this is over with. My pleasure, was what he said, though giving her a leg out bow, fairy tale prince style, to which she tittered and made him a practiced curtsy, so well learnt she barely even stumbled. He slung a hand under either armpit and caught her up with ridiculously little effort, so light her bones like a bloody bird's, letting her fold into him, apparently too tired to yawn. Sleeping bloody beauty. The bedroom in question, which she directed him towards with a series of slurry, chest-muffled murmurs, looked almost exactly the way he'd pictured it would. Big, canopied bed, choked with pillows and fluffy plush dolls. 
cute versions of uncute animals, emo anime characters. He set her down in their embrace and watched her curl into a fetal position, tucking a particularly infectious-looking teddy bear the size of a two-year-old, chenille-furred and shedding worn lace in leprous swaths, down tight between those hungry thighs. Strange little girl, he thought. Well, he was right to want to be rid of her, and not just for the obvious reasons. Best to get to it, then flee this damn place. Nothing so big should be so empty, so quiet. And there it was again, from somewhere, that sound. A dog's nails clicking on the floor one leg at a time. A mouth opening, pop, gasp, only to shut once more, without even an exhaled breath. Get going, son. Grab what you can find and scupper. If only he could tell which direction the sounds were coming from. Closer, now. To his left? No. Right. Bill shut the door behind him with excruciating slowness, tensed for the latch's click, and once he heard it, turned left so hard he thought he might twist an ankle. The candle, left abandoned, with only Cecily's crumpled cigarette butt for company, gave just enough light to navigate by, and Bill took the stairs upwards in loping strides, two by two by two. His heart hammered fast in his throat. The third floor was smaller than it had seemed from below. Just a door on either side, master bedroom versus guest room, or maybe office. Forcing himself not to wonder what might be on the other side, Bill twisted the closed knob and slid in sidelong, trying to keep it open just the bare minimum allowable to admit his frame. Within, he crept across the floor, Tai Chi tread, heel rolling straight and narrow to toe with every touchdown, to at least keep the creaks even. This had to be where Cecily's dearly departed mum and dad once slept— hung with tapestry like some set for Hamlet, a strange mixture of blue velvet and purple trim that shone all the darker in what little moonlight leaked in under drawn blackout shades. Dark like club lighting without the matter of crowds and the underfoot thunder of feet, pulse of music seeping in from everywhere at once as though it were a swarm of tiny biting flies. O oh, low estate, the threat, my... Bill felt his way forwards, in search of drawers, cupboards, some sort of indication that anything had ever been kept in this damnable room besides memories and a place for wrinklies to shag. Something pushed forward under his fingers, a slick surface impossible to hold on to. Something hit the ground with a crunch, right in the midst of a bright stripe of moonlight. A presumably happy couple trapped under a fresh lattice of cracks, Taken someplace sunny enough, their faces were almost impossible to make out in detail, except that the man might have had Cecily's hair color, while the woman's smile cut the exact same angle as her darling daughter's. Bill froze, waiting in vain for another of those. No sounds. Those weird, unidentifiable lack of noises. But none came. So he just kept staring down as though hypnotized, finding himself trying to make out what was there, on the inside crook of dead Mrs. K's arm, just angled so the camera barely registered it, gray on gray, uneven edges. It couldn't be. No. Stupid idea. No one gets a tattoo or whatever just like their mums, you twat. Not even someone as odd as Cecily, surely. Or that was it. God damn it. And that, he realized, at pretty much the very same instant, was the noise. It's right behind me. Before he could tell himself not to, he'd already turned. At first, he genuinely didn't recognize her without all that high-gloss cack on her face. She'd taken her hair down, proving it to be far longer than it had seemed when knotted up, brushing her thighs in one thick, Glossy, dead straight fall, shiny black as her own nail tips. She'd changed, too, into an actual honest-to-God cotton nighty with long, ruffled sleeves and a button-down front, whose collar went up to her jawline. With skin thus mainly hidden, yet feet left bare, 
she looked both younger than before, enough to make him seriously question his own judgment in terms of where he'd chosen to stick his tackle, and sexier than ever in a still freakier way. Do you like the rest of my home, Billy? She said, fluttering her lashes. It's a bit of a dump, but one does what one can. Still, it must have exerted quite a pull on you for you to go stumbling around here in the dark while you thought I was asleep. Well, uh, I was just looking around for... The loo? I do know how you appreciate a nice bathroom, after all. One on every floor, dear, too, sometimes. One wonders how you missed them. Oh, does one? That tone of hers was maddening, not simply the way in which she spoke, but the sentiment, or lack thereof, behind it, and so difficult to listen to as well. Slipped away whenever the ear tried to fasten on it, pig greasy with happy idiocy, as though nothing said like that could be worth paying attention to even with only half an ear. Which was why he found himself trying to focus on the light she held instead, using its soft flicker to steady himself. That's from downstairs, isn't it? Why, yes, it is. Funny you should notice. Why? I was there when you lit it. Course you were. I knew that. But, you see, this is rather a special candle. She took a moment to run her finger over its uppermost quarter, hot wax slopping onto her in a way that anyone else would find unbearable, and made an odd little fiddly gesture that seemed to make a perfect little approximation of somebody's features emerge from the unburnt portion. Not just somebody's, though. For as she did, Bill heard a fold of tapestry pull back, revealing a long, narrow oval of mirror, and glanced automatically towards its surface, there, hanging inside like a drowned corpse under glass, he recognized himself. His blood congealed, the air itself becoming slow, difficult to move through. He could barely think, barely breathe. His chest heaved painfully, a landed fish yearning for water. Whoa, was all he could say by way of reply, and Cecily smirked. Oh, it's an awfully amusing story. You see, when one of my mamma's great-great-whatevers was clapped in durance vile over having been accused of merry-dancing with old Sir S., she smuggled this candle into the clink to make a dolly out of it. And where she put it, I can't possibly say. A very secret place, indeed, if you take my meaning. But... With a frighteningly massive effort, Bill managed to half-turn himself back towards the door, though his feet seemed snared in treacle. His Achilles tendons shot full of Novocaine. He fell to his knees, clutching for Cecily's ankles, but she skipped back out of range as though playing hopscotch, content to let his own weight carry him down onto all fours. And even then, practically parallel with the floor, he couldn't manage to keep upright. Everything hurt impossible to support. His hands gave way, knees bowed inwards, joints unsteady. It's special, you see, Cecily went on, because it can burn all night and still never quite be consumed. The wax grows back like flesh, so that every new woman of my blood may reshape the face to their liking, light it, and use it like a hand of glory to trap our enemies. Though it has other uses too, of course. Summoning the one who first gave it to us, for example, and who is sworn to do our bidding just as we, in turn, swear to eventually pay for that long and faithful service. Behind her, a stirring. A wind ruffling those tapestries as something passed behind them. Dropped pin, quiet, clicking dog's nails, distinct. A lip pop with every step. As for you, meanwhile, Cecily added, how long do you intend to make me wait, exactly? And after all this trouble I've gone to on your behalf? 
The answering voice seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, soft as fallen leaves, saying without haste, A moment's rest is always pleasant, my lady. You do keep me so very busy. Really, Nanny, you're very lazy, all things considered, greedy too. But then, Mama always warned me you were. Rule with an iron hand and all that. Yes, my lady. Your lady mother was a perceptive woman with very good taste. You aren't being impertinent, are you, Nanny? Only a trifle, my lady. Will you deny me that, too? No, Nanny. You may be as impertinent as you like, so long as you do what you're told. Yes, my lady. She rose up then, manifesting from what might have been the bottom of the tapestries, the dark under Cecily's parents' bed or a pile of rags in the corner. Thirty at the most, slim and straight and taller than Cecily, yet bent, willow graceful colored white and black and gray like Cecily's room, with the occasional hint of red at her mouth, her ears, her distressingly long fingers. The dress she wore might have been modeled on Cecily's nightgown, but copied in negative, its fabric less cotton than bombazine, giving off a distinctive swish of underskirts as she stepped forward in her neat little black patent shoes. The click, the pin drop, that was the sound of each movement, not a creak, not a sigh, nothing human. As Bill goggled at the realization, she dipped her head as though he'd spoken out loud, projecting, Yes, I fooled you. I am sorry to play such games. They are the only pleasures left to me, I'm afraid. Well, almost. I do not mean to lie. Lying is the provenance of your species, not mine. But we will talk further of such things soon enough. Where'd you come from? He asked her, barely able to raise what voice remained to him. She simply regarded him silently while Cecily frowned, tapping her nails so that the candle holder rang dully, replying impatiently, Really, Billy, don't you listen? I told you already she's always here. This is Nanny Gray. It was a dream. Had to be. How else could they have moved from one room to another, on whose walls an array of photos gave way to prints, giving way in turn to portraits, etchings, watercolors, oils? And somewhere in each composition... Lurking, patient, and anonymous, behind or beside the centerpiece arrangement of well-dressed men, women, girls, and even some boys, who all shared Cecily's dead straight ink fall of hair, her gray-blue eyes, her cruelly slanted smile. A version of Nanny Gray was present in her long black dress, her sensible footwear, no matter what the era. Nanny is my governess, as I said, Cecily told Bill as she pressed him back onto what felt like a nest of sheets. My servant, my lady-in-waiting. She's my helpmeet, the head of my household. She keeps all of this running, and whatever she does, she does at my pleasure. Raising her voice slightly here, a coiled lash, brandished rather than used. Isn't that so, Nanny? It is, my lady. Since, oh, I forget the year, thirteen oh oh something, Mama said. Thirteen forty six, my lady. When the very fount of your blood was almost cut off in full flower, for was it treason? Yes. You kitelers are treasonous by nature, I believe. And to kill one's husband then, no matter what provocation might have preceded such a desperate act, was considered just as bad as conspiring to kill the king himself. They burnt women at the stake for it, just as surely as for witchcraft, soaked in oil and pitch with no hope of merciful strangulation, whilst crowds screamed and pelted them with garbage. 
Better by far to turn to the devil than God under such circumstances, Cecily chimed in, with an air of quoting something learned by rote. Or easier, anyhow. Down there in the dark, yes, amongst the rats and bones. A bad place for any pretty woman to end. But then again, that is where your ancestor Lady Alice eventually found me, after all. Where we found each other more accurately. Quite. But the promise behind our contract isn't enough to satisfy Nenny, you see. Not always. And though it's such a bother to arrange for boys like you to come visit every once in a while, Nenny does so much work on our behalf that she really must be kept happy. It's only good manners. I do value good manners, you see. Courtesy, common or otherwise. The little gestures. Manners maketh man, and all that. A party dress on an ape, that's all they are when everything is said and done. But since there's no alternative, they simply have to do. Given it must have been God who deeded you to us in the first place, directly or in, do you think perhaps we might be part of your hell, Nanny? I often ask myself that very question, my lady. But to no avail? None, my lady. That's prayer for you, Nanny. Yes, my lady. Nanny Gray eddied forward with one long white hand on her breast, head bent down submissively, and when she looked up, eyes pleasantly crinkled. She smiled so wide that Bill could see how her teeth were packed together far too numerously for most human beings, bright as little red eyes in the wet darkness of her mouth, while her eyes, on the other hand, were white, white as real teeth, as salt, as a blank page upon which some unlucky person's name had yet to be inscribed. Little master, she murmured, you wished a tour, I believe, and no one knows this house better than I. Come with me, please. I don't. Oh, it will be no trouble. What my lady orders, I do. For as she told you, this is the bargain between us, the terms of my employment. Yes, and I do hope you were finally paying attention, silly Billy, because with so little time left, I'd hate to have to repeat myself. Cecily leant down then, pressing one ear to Bill's chest in a vile parody of post-coital relaxation. But when Nanny Gray laid one of those two long hands on his forehead a moment later, he felt his heart lurch and stutter as though he were about to have a heart attack, pounding double, triple, quadruple time. Cecily must have heard it, for she gave yet another of those rippling laughs, and he wanted nothing more than to be able to rouse his limbs enough to tear her soft white throat open with his thumbs. She drew back and pouted. I'm going to tell you something now, Billy, she said, because I actually quite like you, all things considered. One day, when I turn Nanny over to my daughter the way Mamma turned her over to me, she will take me wherever she's taking you, wherever she took my Mamma and hers before her, so on, etc. Back to the first of us, great Lady Alice in her shit-filled cell. So there, that might help. Bill swallowed hard, barely scraping enough air to whisper, It really doesn't. Hmm, suppose not. Shouldn't think it would. But then, I did only say might. He sank down further, then excruciatingly slow, into a deep, deep blackness, only to hear them still arguing as he went. Do this, Nanny Gray, do that, Nanny Gray, eat up, Nanny Gray. You'll expect me to digest him completely as well, I'm sure, just to save you the trouble of having to cover up your own indiscretions. Well, I could simply take him away now if you'd prefer, 
But what on earth would be the use of that, considering there are limits to even your perversity, I'm sure? Really, it's you kitelers who are the lazy ones. Never doing anything for yourselves. What sort of example do you think that sets for everyone else? Oh, pish tosh, Nanny. Why should we have to make the effort when we have you to do it for us? Crazy, Bill told them both through stiffening lips, to which Cecily only smiled as ever, while Nanny Gray raised a single, perfectly arched eyebrow, expressionless as a cast pewter mask, and murmured in return, I had wings once, little master. You'd be disappointed too, I'd venture, if you found yourself where I find myself now. Poor Nanny! Quite the come-down, wasn't it? A fall, yes, both long and hard, and at the end of it. Me! Cecily supplied brightly. Wasn't that nice? A pause, infinite as some gigantic clock's gears turning over, millennial, epical, deep time caught in the shallowest of all possible circuits and only digging itself deeper. After which, Bill heard the thing that called itself Nanny Gray reply with truly terrible patience. Even so, my lady. The Magician's Apprentice by Tamson Muir When she was thirteen, Mr. Hollis told her, There's never more than two, Cherry, the magician and the magician's apprentice. That was the first year, and she spent her time slowly magicking water from one glass to another as he read the newspaper and drank the coffee. Magician's apprentice had to get the Starbucks. Caramel macchiato, no foam, extra hot, which was a yuppie drink if you asked her, but nobody did. Quarter in, he'd say, and she'd concentrate on the liquid shivering from cup to cup. Now half. Slower. For Cherry Murphy, the water always staggered along. She'd seen him make it dance with a twitch of his fingers. When do I get to stop bullets? My hypothesis is that stopping bullets would be friggin' sweet. Maybe when you do your homework said Mr. Hollis, and so she'd take out her homework. It wasn't even magic homework. It was stuff like Catcher in the Rye. Mr. Hollis was big on literature, so after they cleared the table of glasses, he'd trick her into arguing about Holden Caulfield. Could have been worse. To make her feel better, he'd given her Catch-22, and Cherry had read it approximately a million times. He said she easily read at college level, though he also said that didn't amount to much these days. All right, said her master magician, when her chin had started to droop. Now you eat. Magic wore terrible holes in you. Just shunting water around would give her a headache and throbbing nosebleeds, so he'd fry up a steak or fresh brown eggs and watch her gobble them down while saying, Elbows off the table. The steak was always bloody. The eggs were always soft-boiled. Food would take the edge off, but not enough. Second lesson. Magic feeds off your soul, said Mr. Hollis. There's only two ways to not be hungry, Cherry. I'm sorry. Two ways? How? One, quit magic, Harriet Potter, he said. But then he pushed the plate of eggs at her. Her master magician never seemed hungry like she was. Seconds simple. Eat more. After dinner, they usually had a little time. She'd told him over and over that Mark wouldn't notice if she came home at midnight covered in blood, but he always said, Don't disrespect your dad. Which was why she thought he was kind of a stiff. Then he'd follow it up with, He does that enough on his own. Which was why she loved him. So until 6.30 hit, they'd watch the last 15 minutes of a Golden Girls rerun, 
or listen to some Led Zeppelin, his iPod strung earbud to earbud between them both. Only then was she really content. Mr. Hollis was a bachelor with a girlfriend downtown, so his apartment always kind of smelled like Old Spice and Dead Body. Only she would have knocked back neat bleach before saying so. When 6.30 came, he'd say, Put on your jacket. Even if outside it was average surface temperature of the sun and she'd die of heat stroke. Then he'd say, See you later, alligator. And she'd say, In a while, crocodile. Or if the day had been crappy, she'd just make a series of grunts. Then she'd skip home through the dusk to her empty house or her passed out, empty father, and read Catch-22 until she fell asleep. There were spells on which everything hinged, he said, to move, stop, and make. The spell that year was move. Cool, fine. She was always on the move. Cherry had long, spindly limbs like a juvenile spider, and before she'd been an apprentice, she'd taken track and baseball. Her fingers did drum solos if she wasn't given things to do with them. All of that nervous energy went into her spells, and she worried her lips skinless as her water dripped. Her winds scattered, and any attempt to lift stuff embedded it in the far-off wall. Mr. Hollis primly mopped tables dry and set her to roll a marble around on the slick linoleum. But he made it look so easy. There was not a flicker in those paper-gray eyes as a curl of his hand coaxed a hairbrush out of his drywall, beckoning it to remove itself and have the plaster rework to pre-cherry wholeness. Objects put themselves back in his hands, ashamed. His marble rolled in perfect madman's circles. Once, wild with frustration and knees scored with tile lines, she ignored him when he said, Leave it. Stop. Her marble wobbled in a wide spiral. Cherry! She feigned deafness. Her head suddenly spun towards him, yanked by invisible iron fingers, and worst of all, her marble rolled away, lost under the fridge forever. Cherry, he said evenly, I don't ask twice. I could do this. Screw you. That got her grounded for a week before she realized he technically didn't have the authority to do so. Cherry sulked to bed each night at nine o'clock anyway. June. In the summer evenings, Mr. Hollis went off with his girlfriend, so they'd spend three brilliant breakfast hours down at the beach, rolling grains of sand from palm to palm. Her skinny arms and legs grew browner, if not less skinny, and he made her wear a one-piece instead of a bikini. Nice try, but no cigar. But each of those days was more perfect than the last. Homework was John Knowles' A Separate Piece, you could give me something with a good movie, Mr. H. And he sat shirtless under the beach umbrella as she read aloud. Mr. Hollis had rangy bones and a nerdy fishbelly farmer's tan, lots of crisp, dark hairs on his arms and his chest. It was possible that somebody found him hot, but only theoretically so. The fact that he had a girlfriend was mystifying. Possibly being a magician and the ensuing squillions of dollars, or at least the squillions as was her understanding, sweetened the deal. That summer she also rolled marbles until her nostrils squirted blood and she found herself eating raw hot dogs from the freezer. It was pretty gross. Cherry was hungry until her mouth hurt. After August she struggled at his kitchen table, pushing ball bearings. Her head hurt. Sometimes he would ignore her, and it was a kindness, as she had her pride, even if she was in seventh grade. And sometimes he would briefly ruffle his hand through her short, dark hair and say, Be Zen. I'm never going to get this. You're going to get it, emo kid. If I die, I leave you all my stuff. Try bequeath, you bequeath me all your stuff. When she did start to get the magic, in between Knowles and a separate piece, Mr. Hollis gave her a single brief smile that made the rest of it a cinch. 
The marble rolled its circle. The water halved into its glass. As a test, he set his Honda Civic in first gear, and she pushed it inch by burning inch, nine feet forward. She puked bloodied bile afterwards like a champ, him holding her hair, but once her stomach settled, he took her out for lobster. It was the kind where you picked your sacrifice out of its tank and were eating ten minutes later. It tasted incredible. Congratulations, cadet, said Mr. Hollis, gesturing with the fork. Here's my toast. I'm proud of you. First we take Manhattan, Cherry, then we take Berlin. Her joy was wild, and her coke sweet like imagined champagne. When she was fourteen, Mr. Hollis told her, The apprenticeship only ends when you know everything the magician knows and understand everything the magician understands. Cherry took this to mean that she'd be an apprentice until she was, like, thirty. He switched from caramel macchiatos to skinny vanilla lattes, which this year she pointed out was totally gay, and earned her a long, indifferent look. Mr. Hollis was an award winner at indifferent looks. He could scratch you with the word, or by flicking his pale aluminum eyes away at any place but you. The hunger still boiled low in her belly as she jumped water from cup to cup to cup, but crushingly all he'd say now was, Cute one-trick pony. Instead, he got her to empty the glass out over the sink and try to divert it upwards. Cherry spent most of her time on her feet and mopping at her T-shirt when this proved to be a son of a bitch, and all he did was sit at the kitchen table reading his newspaper. That had started to drive her a little crazy, too. Mr. Hollis was a slob who left the sports section lying around and never dusted. But when she started scrubbing his stove and looking for his dust buster, he said, Don't go there. Jen doesn't even go there. He'd been dating Jennifer Blumfield for over a year now. Cherry had been introduced as his niece. Jen did accounting and was sweet without being patronizing but she hated her a little anyway and bullshitted her best smile to hide it. Only complete dumbasses weren't nice to the girlfriend. Mr. Hollis wasn't prehistoric, and even though his five driver's licenses showed four different ages, he was allowed to date. Are you going to tell her about the magic thing? Cherry hadn't expected the cold shoulder. You never tell anyone about what we do, Charlene. I didn't think you capable of being this big an imbecile. Her eyes had smarted, and his were turned away. They went from Knowles to Dickens, David Copperfield. She'd argued it was abuse. That was the year of many long arguments. She liked Marlowe, he liked Shakespeare. He liked Austin, and she liked American Lit. Mr. Hollis set her to tossing M&Ms up in the air and slowing their descent, staring down his narrow nose in impatience at any cracks in their hard candy carapaces. It sucked. And she might have been prodigious for fourteen, but not in science. That was the year she also had to stay half an hour after school for remedial physics, which was stupid, but Mr. Hollis was calmly unsympathetic. Suck it down. You can't pass high school with just one subject. He was equally unsympathetic to the notion that, as a magician's apprentice, physics was beneath her. I still have a day job, Cherry. You do not have a day job. Every so often a car comes around and you get in and then you come back with a suitcase full of cash. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that I bet you my whole life you are not making money off a David Copperfield quiz Olympics. Whatever he was doing, he wouldn't tell her. A big black car would pull up outside and he'd be waiting in a suit, and the driver would even open the door for him and he'd nod coolly like the guy was toilet paper attached to his heel. Cherry would hang around outside for hours and hours until he came back, and even then he'd only let her get a whiff of that new money smell before the case shut and disappeared.
She hoped all the time this meant Disneyland instead of college. I don't care. I'm not countenancing your future ignorance if I have to live with it. She asked furtively about higher education. Ivy League, champ. Oh, Jesus. On the brighter side, that was also the year Callum asked her to the dance. He was older and wore seriously skinny jeans. Tenth graders usually weren't all that interested in eighth graders, but they liked the same bands and she'd graduated to a real bra with an underwire and wore short shorts starting May. The first and last time she'd worn them to Mr. Hollis's, his eyebrows shot up to his hairline. You seem to be sans pants. They're Daisy Dukes, old man. I am trying to maximize my coolness, okay? A newspaper page got flipped. They looked better on Daisy Duke. Put on my gym pants before you go home. That suggestion is completely horrifying. Yes, Cherry? Definitely not amused. His professor voice always turned into sharp, hard-edged vowels when he was pissed, like a movie villain. Are you suffering hearing trouble, 